Good morning and welcome everyone and happy St. Patrick's Day. Uh, welcome to the 425th regular meeting of the Oregon Environmental Quality Commission. Uh, and today we have um, a full schedule of updates. Um, so we will also let the record show as we get underway that all commissioners are present, uh, including our new director, Leah Feldon. So uh, let's begin with um, first just reflecting on our mission as we always do, which is just to remember that DEQ's mission is to be a leader in restoring, maintaining, and enhancing the quality of Oregon's air, land, and water. Uh, and with that, let's introduce our new director, uh, Leah Felden, and uh, give her an opportunity to share some thoughts as she begins this new and important work. Good morning. Thank you, Chair George. Thank you, commissioners. It's uh, great to be with you here this morning. I'm enjoying a little sunlight. I hope you all are as well from, from where you are sitting today. Um, thanks for this, this opportunity. We're not doing, um, as I'd mentioned, we're not doing a typical uh, director's report like we um, normally do in our commission meetings. Um, and we will, again, this is just a little bit of a, um, a deviation for this meeting um, since uh, I'm new in the director role. And we also have a very short meeting. So as part of your materials, there is a typical director's report. Um, but I just want to take this opportunity this morning to um, take it up a level and just talk a little bit about um, some priorities of mine and for the agency and um, things that I've been discussing with our leadership team. So that's um, mostly what I'm gonna talk about here this morning. So let me just start with um, thanking you all commissioners again for the honor of leading such a wonderful agency. I'm really excited to see where uh, DEQ can go. Um, and to be part of that next era alongside more than 700 staff that are really the soul of this agency. Um, and before I go into some of the work of my first 30 days, um, give or take, I want to uh, reintroduce you to DEQ's leadership team. So you've got just a um, little bit of a refresh on who all is a part of that team today. Um, so here uh, is our amazing leadership team. Just quickly to go through, you can see uh, Brian Bowling. He is our Central Services Division Administrator. Uh, Travis Lucky is our CIO. Harry Estev is our Communications Director. Matt Davis is our Interim Policy and External Affairs Manager. Lori Pillsbury is our Laboratory Administrator. Ali Mirzakalili is our Air Quality Administrator. Lydia Emer is our Land Quality Administrator. Jennifer Weigel, our water quality administrator. And then moving to the regions, we have Shannon Davis, who is our Eastern Region Administrator, Christine Svekovich, our Northwest Region Administrator, and Keith Anderson, our Western Region Administrator. So um, this is the leadership team as it sits uh, today. And I just wanted to take a little pause so that you can see them all. Some of these folks um, tend to present to the commission a fair amount. And so you're, you have some familiarity, but some of our administrators um, are, you know, not in, um, in the business of bringing you um, rulemaking policy changes. And so you're not seeing them as often, but they, all of these people have um, really important roles in this agency. And, um, the team has been working so hard over the last several months and continues to propel this agency forward and support me as we navigate so much transition. Um, this leadership team and I, we've been talking a lot about what they want in the next era of leadership at DEQ, um, what they want it to look like for all of us. And together we've been discussing our priorities and setting the course for our future in leadership of DEQ. Um, I would say that we are grounding our commitments for this next era and, and really beginning to center around a theme of organizational health, a focus that means prioritizing all employees' experience of belonging and inclusivity at DEQ. This is where we, the theme that we kind of keep coming back to and really um, are centering around at this moment. Um, we're exploring the actions that 
are going to be necessary to being an anti-racist agency committed to justice and safety for all of our employees. And to set a solid foundation in this work, the leadership team and the DEI Council are both going through extensive training with our consultant engaged to change right now. So we really look forward to the possibilities that are in front of us. And I can tell you that that entire team is committed to, um, to, to exploring together and learning um, and developing the actions that we need to take um, at DEQ for a sense of belonging for, for everyone um, in our agency. Um, I wanna highlight several other priorities that uh, we've been discussing at leadership and, and priorities that I hold personally. Uh, the written director's report includes a piece on environmental justice work. And um, before I talk about that a bit, I just uh, want to call out two people who have been just absolutely um, amazing leaders in that work. And that is not to say there aren't several staff that are working on environmental justice work there are, and they're and they're all doing um, amazing work. But um, I want to call out Jimena Cruz Cuevas and Stephanie Caldera for their leadership in this space. This work um, would not be possible without really unwavering tenacity. I'm going to say and passion and self organizing of our EJ work group. Um, they are really self starters and they are led by their passion for environmental justice and um in the agency just had a presentation from them um i believe it was last week and um where they got to really just display everything that they've been working on and talk a little bit about the subgroups that they've formed this information's in your um in your written report and, and highlight the good work that they're doing. And um, so soon the EJ work group and I are gonna be getting together to discuss their work, discuss their priorities and how the leadership team will be supporting this work into the next era, which includes strengthening our internal infrastructure to support the work and creating a way to sustain environmental justice as a foundation in our policies. Um, this is a moment of, of shifting. It's not, creating policy and then taking an environmental justice lens to it. It's starting with an environmental justice foundation and building policy and practices off of that. Um, so that's the shift that we are making today at DEQ. Um, moving on, this week, uh, we also let staff know that we are taking a fresh look at our measurement system at DEQ. We have had our outcomes, our outcome-based uh, measure system, it's called outcome-based management. Um, for those who've been around DEQ for a long time, um, and for those who haven't, frankly, that name may not resonate very much. So, hence um, the need to take a fresh look. We've we've had that system since 2011. Um, Twelve years have have gone by um, amazingly. I remember working with uh, many folks in this agency to develop that system. And um, it's really time to take a new look at what we're measuring, why we measure it, what it does or does not tell us about the outcomes that we want to achieve. Um, I think our current system, um, while it's been really helpful in bringing DEQ into this mode of um, measurement and, and looking at how we're doing and um, improving and enjoying that process, I think it only tells part of the story. And, um, but given the maturity of the system, we now have several people in the agency who are either current measure owners, so they're kind of responsible for the measure and, and, and how we uh, measure the thing that um, that particular measure is all about, or they're data stewards. Um, and the data stewards are the folks that collect the information that feeds the measurement system. So we have a lot of expertise um, in the agency around this which is fantastic. Um, so we're gonna be hosting a meeting to gather all of these folks for an idea generating session about the future of measures um, at DEQ. And the goal there really being to create a system that tells the story of how we're doing at achieving the environmental public health and environmental justice outcomes with our policies and implementation. So more to come 
on that. That's not going to be um, a system change that happens overnight. And it also doesn't mean that a lot of the things that we're measuring now, we won't continue to measure. Um, but a fresh look at the system is coming. So we're really excited about that. Um, moving, oh, yes. Let me get a question, Commissioner Kyle. Yeah, I was just curious how much of that kind of new dashboard also coincides with that governor's uh, request to kind of develop that dashboards. Are those uh, overlapping? I appreciate items? that. Yeah, I think they I think they will be overlapping. So the current um, system, I would just describe it as measuring um, more uh, outputs than outcomes. And so one thing we want to do with the system is say, you know, what are the environmental outcomes that we're trying to achieve and how do we measure whether we're achieving those things like measuring permits, how many permits do we get out the door and our timeliness in all different realms and how many samples have we analyzed, those are going to continue. Those are really important measures of our outputs. So those absolutely will um, continue as well. And as you say, uh, Commissioner Kyle, the governor's expectations for timeliness around um, hiring, for example, um, is going to come into play here. Um, having whether the agency has a strategic plan on time and a DEI plan, those things will all come into our measurement system as well. And we're actually expected to be um, tracking those things on some form of an agency dashboard, which we've already um, begun creating and I'll talk a little bit about as well. So Lee, in regard to that, and, and let me know if, if you were still coming to this. So you mentioned um, the importance of the work uh, going forward uh, with uh, our, our new and our new focus or our restored and strengthened focus on environmental justice and the work within um, the EJ Council and the DEI Council. Um, and, and you then went into talking about establishing, you know, outcomes and benchmarks and things like that. So what are um, one of the things that the EQC, you know, really heard throughout all our recent meetings, and we, we've made a very high priority and want to be sure that we're working with you and with the others closely, is how is, and what is the time frame for establishing outcomes in regard to DEI work and environmental justice work at DEQ? We know that we have to move from kind of broad goal speaking about saying, yeah, we want to do these things, these things are important to us, we need to transition to establishing those specific outcomes and then also establishing timelines so that you know we can have accountability to ourselves and others and the people that we report to. Um, so could you share a little bit about what the time frame is and, and, and who all is going to be participating in the establishment of those outcomes so that we get to a point where we know what is it that's going to look different in the future than it does today? Thank you, Chair George, for the question. Um, a couple answers on that. One, with regard to some of the governor's expectations, just starting there, because that's kind of easy to describe. Um, I think there are very clear timelines for when agencies need to have uh, a DEI plan established. Um, there are very clear timelines for when the strategic plan needs to be established. We'll be submitting our uh, first DEI plan in June of this year. And we'll be uh, submitting our first strategic plan by June of 2024. Those are timelines that are established across the enterprise. Um, but perhaps um, I'm going to say just as importantly, when it comes to the outcomes that we're looking for within DEQ, those to me are they go, they're going to go beyond um, what we may have in this first DEI plan. And you know, there's a reason that we're going to be updating the DEI plan annually is because this needs to be shifting and evolving. When it comes to a specific timeline for work in DEQ around DEI and EJ, my answer is that's not my answer to give. It's something that I need to work on and that the leadership team is going to be working on um, alongside the DEI council our affinity groups, our EJ work group, and others in the agency. So a specific timeline with specific actions is not developed yet. And I think that by the nature of some of this work, it needs to be constantly evolving. 
This is not a check the box exercise. We are not gonna have a checklist that tells us when we have become inclusive enough <laughs> or when we have achieved enough diversity. We will never have that sort of checklist. So together with the other folks in our agency, that's really the first step is the training I've talked about and then coming together to discuss what are the steps and, and how do we wanna develop this together? It's not gonna be something that I, um, you know, put out a plan that I develop on my own. Um, it needs to be done in collaboration. Absolutely, completely, completely appreciate that. Um, and I don't think anybody's interested in, in check the box exercises. Um, and, and yet, I, I guess I also just want to be assured that there is some point at which we're going to be getting more specific, right? So it sounds like there's a plan that's gonna be submitted in June, but you know, I also hear you saying, that the DEQ's work is going to be larger and more expansive than that. So, um, uh, and I really appreciate also your thoughts about, you know, the importance of working with others, that it can't just be the executives, you know, DEI plan, but like, you know, with, within a year, will we have some goals and time frames that we don't have now within six months? And we may not have an answer to that today, which I, I really want to appreciate about what you shared. Um, but, but we all have also at DEQ, we've been talking about these things for what, a, over a year now. Um, and it just seems there needs to be some point at which we go from just talking about very broadly our values to what's going to be different in the future than it is today. And so I guess I'm just looking forward to hearing regular updates about your work with all your partners throughout the agency, both internally and externally. Um, uh, and and no, I don't. Nobody's looking for a check the box exercise. That's for sure. But that at some point we do want to start talking about. We can't. We can't. I think really engage in that work until we know what some of our benchmarks that we're working towards are. So I think I'm just looking forward to hearing how those conversations evolve and what kind of uh, outcomes uh, DEQ identifies as being really important. Yeah, I think um, what I would say to that, Chair George, is um, again, this is a this is th these are conversations that we need to to have alongside our partners, and you know the the notion of establishing you know benchmarks um, around this work, I think, is something we need to discuss because in in many cases, I think. Um, for those who have experienced things in DEQ that they don't wanna be experiencing, um, perhaps what we need to say is a benchmark is the absence of certain things. And um, you know, how, do we, how do we continue to improve that sense of belonging and safety within this agency? Um, but yeah, um, I think there are many things that we are already working on and, and DEQ um, in the last couple of years has brought on the DEI council. We have brought on a DEI coordinator. We need to fill that position again. Um, we do have the affinity groups and we're working toward the DEI plan. These are things that DEQ did not have a year and a half ago. Um, so that's the foundation. The foundation is the people. And it's those who want to engage in, in this work and, and help us help leadership to bring this um, important work to the rest of this nearly 800 person agency. So um, absolutely more to come, um, but we need to first do that in partnership with our, with our folks. Absolutely. Okay. Um, so moving forward, um, and yes, please, any questions along the way, of course, I welcome them. Um, I would say that um, a focus for DEQ um, at this point, and this is maybe getting kind of more to operations, um, we've kind of been on the, on the culture side and, and where we want to go there, um, but in terms of some of the operations um, including governor's expectations. Um, it, it's just the leadership team is very focused on how we continue to um, ensure operational excellence as a priority 
and the importance of focusing on implementation of our programs and um, performance and, and tracking with regard to the governor's priorities as well. So as I mentioned, we've already set up a system for tracking progress on the governor's expectations and the leadership team will be responsible for those, those results. And um, we intend to have that very visible for um, all DEQ employees to see on a regular basis as well. Um, so this work includes, as I mentioned before, um, work on our strategic plan for DEQ. As you know, we have a steering committee of broad representation within DEQ on the strategic plan. The committee has uh, committed to developing an anti-racist inclusive plan through anti-racist inclusive processes. And our consultants who I've mentioned engaged to change are working um, with us on that. The governor has asked that all state agencies have a plan in place by June of 2024. And we feel we have a significant head start given our foundational work to date. So we're excited to bring that um, in the coming year to DEQ. Um, Again, this also includes our DEI plan, and we are committed at DEQ to developing a plan for how we're going to implement diversity, equity, and inclusion and belonging throughout the agency, as I've already mentioned. Um, and I've already mentioned that the several groups that we have that are working towards that in DEQ, um, and so we're going to be making sure that we meet the governor's um, deadlines on that, but also looking at you know, what more broadly are we doing within our agency? Um, recruitment and vacancies, just a note on that. Um, DEQ is undergoing a significant number of recruitments to fill vacancies. And this is definitely one of the more challenging areas of work for the agency right now. Our HR staff are working incredibly hard. So I want to just mention our amazing uh, human resources staff and manager Penny Robertson, they've, um, they are just recruiting and interviewing and recruiting and interviewing and recruiting and interviewing all the time <laughs> um, and, and helping keeping these things going at DEQ. And the, the very good story here is that, um, you know, in many cases are, we're promoting from within and staff are getting opportunities to, to move around the agency and um, and explore new areas. But then of course we have you know a vacancy somewhere else. So this is something that we're um, that we're working on um, and uh, really want to appreciate the HR staff. Um, we've talked a little bit about this notion of um, uh, the core outputs for the agency. So I just want to um, emphasize again that that will continue to be an important, um, part of our work, specifically timely and effective permitting for the regulated community. Um, it's an area we've emphasized over the last several years, and it's paid off. We've made um, gains in both our water and air permitting. We want to keep that up. Um, the backlogs are going down due to the hard work and diligence of our staff and the guidance and structure provided by management in those areas. So, it, you know, we have more to do and we are really focused on maintaining the gains that we've had in those areas. Um, finally, in the realm of operational excellence, I've talked a lot about, um, you know, what I call sort of DEQ's financial and fiduciary duties. And um, this really relates to many financial incentive programs that, that we have as well as pass through dollars and the importance of DEQ's oversight of these systems. A huge part of our budget, if you look at the total amount of money that comes through DEQ at this point, a huge amount is really uh, passed through dollars. It's dollars that we are responsible for getting out to communities in some form. It could be grants, it could be um, loans, it could be rebates, and um, we grant and loan hundreds of millions of dollars every biennium in wastewater infrastructure, on-site systems, diesel retrofit grants, EV rebates, VW settlement funds, and we oversee markets and clean fuels and the climate protection program. So this has just become a really robust, um, significant piece of DEQ's work. And I, um, I, I'm really committed to how we um, sort of um, self audit and make sure that our oversight of that, of that work is robust. 
um, we're bolstering the oversight of those systems and we're actually seeking resources in this legislative session um, around um, having more staff to help us as we bring in these federal dollars um, that are coming quickly and with a lot of um, deadlines to get these dollars out quickly. So we are seeking some staff to help us move that money effectively. Um, I just have two more things to cover and I'm, I see the time here, so I'll be brief. Um, deputy director, um, as you saw from the leadership team, we do not have a deputy director right now. We want a deputy director. So I just wanna make sure that's really clear that that leadership team is not complete at the moment. Um, and first, my, my first commitment in looking for a deputy director or considering a deputy director and thinking about what that role looks like for DEQ today um, was to explore it with our leadership team and to hear from all of the leaders that, that you saw there, what their hopes and desires are for attributes for a next deputy director. And we are still in these conversations, but I think we've gained some insight and commonality in our thinking. And we're also considering the reporting structure, just only at the highest level of leadership to ensure that the reports to the deputy and director maximize everyone's roles and really um, maintain agency efficiency. Um, so the LT is gonna continue to be involved in, um, in this work as we begin the search. And um, for the moment, I will say they are also very aligned in asking that we have an interim deputy director. Um, so, um, you know, I think that will help a lot if we have an interim, um, to, to help us. And so we can really take the time necessary to find our next deputy and make sure that we don't rush that out of, um, operational need. So I do plan to appoint an interim, um, deputy in the next, um, week to two weeks, but more to come on that. And certainly I will be updating all of you, um, as I progress in that process. Um, my last thing to mention is that um, I have developed a goal for myself to visit every DEQ office in my first year. Um, you know, one advantage to being someone who's been around the agency for a while is that I do know many staff, um, but there are many I have not yet met. Um, and getting around the state is important to me in this role. And, um, you know, I'm certainly cultivating new relationships in this role externally, but I'm really focused on the work we need to do internally, and I want to get around to all of the offices to hear from all of our staff um, about where they're at and, and their needs and their hopes and desires for this next era at DEQ. Um, so I'm looking forward to reconnecting with everyone all around the state. And that's what I have for you this morning. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, a lot of work going on and a lot of work coming and coming quickly. So we will Look forward to continuing those conversations uh, with you and with the others that need to, to be included. But yes, you are right. We need to uh, move on. Um, but before we do that, I just do want to be sure to take a moment and welcome uh, Chandra Ferrari from the Board of Forestry, who is our liaison for the Board of Forestry. Thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate your being here. And with that, we will welcome Matt Davis and uh, turn it over for the legislative and budget updates. Chair George, if I might just quickly, as Matt gets um, geared up here, um, just a quick note from my perspective um, with session, um, I've been talking to many um, legislators, mm -hmm. many new legislators. So I would say this is a, you know, an era of um, some newness for um, many of the folks in the building and um, coming back in the building for the first time in several years as well. Um, so we are doing a lot to talk about our priorities at DEQ and those conversations I think have been going well. Um, I wanna just highlight the amazing team behind all the work that goes into legislative session. Matt Davis, a um, Abby Baduras, Ryan Hoof, Aaron Tiberbaugh, Adam Kotu, Shamal Karan, Melinda Mahoney and Logan Gillis. And, um, you know, Matt Davis has stepped into this interim manager role, not only running, but sprinting. And that is no exaggeration. Um, he has not missed a beat. I'm so impressed and grateful for his work and leadership of DEQ through this session. So just wanted to start there. And now we'll let Matt 
take it up, take it away. <laughs> Thanks, um, Director Feldman, for the kind words. And good morning, Chair George and Commission for the record, Matt Davis, uh, <clears throat> Interim Policy and External Affairs Manager. And yeah, it's really my pleasure to speak to you this morning and give you, um, you know, your normal routine update on the legislative session, but but also your update on um, DEQ's governor's recommended budget. You all haven't met since Governor Kotick released her budget, and we want to walk you through what that means for DEQ. I'm joined this morning by Ryan Huff. Ryan will introduce himself a little bit later in the in the presentation, but um, he'll also be speaking today. Uh, next slide, please. So, yeah, I thought we'd start by just sharing, um, you know, some reflections on the dynamics we're seeing so far in this uh, 2023 legislative session. Some of which uh, the director already mentioned. One is. Um, you know, significant new membership in the legislature itself. Almost half of the House are, are new, serving first term. Um, and that's a big lift for those folks. You know, they were elected just a few months ago and they don't have a lot of time to get up to speed and learn the ins and outs of the process. And um, so that's, and, and they are of course also learning about the work of all the agencies. And that's really our role in that process is to help those members on board the work of DEQ, what we're doing now, um, what the legislature has talked about previously, those kinds of things. There's also um, quite a few new folks on the Senate side, although most of them uh, were moved from the House to the Senate. So they might be new to the chamber, but certainly have experience uh, in the legislature. The other dynamic is new leadership. We have new Senate president and new Speaker of the House. And the minority office leaders are both you know, relatively new in the last couple of years. And so uh, there's learning there to do in the in the leadership offices as well. Um, can I go back to the, the other slide I was on, Jennifer, Harry? Thanks. Um, this is also the first session that is fully in person since the 2020 short session, uh, which is um, kind of Exciting, also interesting. If you've been down there, you've seen the Capitol is, is under significant construction, seismic retrofitting work, um, and so you uh, the the space itself is somewhat constrained. Um, but one, you know, I think really nice thing that the legislature has carried forward from the is really an enhanced opportunity for anyone to participate virtually in the committee proceedings in particular. And still seeing a lot of public participation in that way in addition to you know, traditional in the building work. Um, the next thing I'd mention is a, you know, a lot of bipartisanship so far this session and bipartisanship on big issues. And that's really, um, I, I would just reflect on kind of that era, era of collegiality that at least I'm feeling in the in the building so far, which is also nice. And related to that, um, quick action on some really big priorities, which is also a departure from recent sessions where we've seen some of the really big issues kind of um, continue to be worked on throughout the session. And most of them aren't completely through the process, but pretty significant breakthroughs um, on housing and homelessness, spending the semiconductor special committee on Semiconductor manufacturing finished their big work this week and passed um, a bill out of that joint committee almost unanimously. And, and again, I mean, the, the vast majority of measures are moving through the building on a bipartisan basis. And then just quickly kind of back to DEQ, just to expand a little bit on Director Feldman's remarks. You know, as you know, we, we lost both Nancy Bennett and Annalisa Batia this year. They had a combined decade of experience representing the agency in the legislature. And that um, it does that that is a real loss and doesn't come without impact. And I also want to thank the team um, for just their incredible work this session. Uh, Director Felder mentioned everyone by name. That includes the legislative affairs staff and also the fiscal staff that are working behind the scenes to evaluate you know, DEQ's ability to implement any number of pieces of legislation. And uh, I should have mentioned there are uh, over 2,800 bills that have already been introduced that we've um, had to, you know, review for, for a DEQ impact. So quite the workload. All right, next slide, please. 
I'm going to shift a little bit to DEQ's governor's recommended budget. This figure shows a comparison between our 21-23 legislatively approved budget, that's the budget we've been operating under this biennium, versus the governor's uh, recommended budget. You'll remember the budget process is a, a three-step process. The agency prepares a, a request budget that goes to the governor's office who has to produce um, a statewide balanced budget, uh, and that's referred to as the governor's recommended budget. And the governor's recommended budget is really the launch point to the legislative deliberations who ultimately approve, uh, develop and approve the state's budget. Governor Kotek released her governor's recommended budget on January 31st with a real emphasis on her three priorities, helping homelessness, behavioral health, and education. Um, so what does it mean for DEQ? Uh, I think DEQ, um, our governor's recommended budget, um, you know, what we saw was it really avoids any significant cuts in our programming, which is of course um, important, and also makes some strategic general fund investments in some, some important areas of work, including environmental justice, climate and drinking water protection. We're gonna walk through that in a little more detail. The budget also includes several proposed fee increases in order to maintain uh, existing work at the agency. Uh, so Matt, this, and you may be gonna cover this in just a minute, but um, looking at, at this these overview chart, this overview chart, it would appear that this includes a more than $50 million cut to, to air quality. I don't know if if we've been able to analyze exactly where all that comes from yet, but just thinking about the cleaner air Oregon work we need to do, and I don't know if some of our climate protection uh, falls under that category. So that that to me seems a little bit concerning, and and we'll want to know how um, where where those cuts would be coming. I'm also a little concerned to see a cut to our water quality work, which we've really just been trying to to I think build rebuild to to a level of capacity that that is needed so um sorry if i'm jumping ahead but i just want to kind of know if we have a sense of where those cuts would come yeah and sort uh, of senator chair george <laughs> um excellent Gave question. promotion there for a second that was that was great thanks man yeah um it, the the Good news is that the charts are somewhat misleading in that the legislatively approved budget includes one-time appropriations that were never intended to roll over. And that's true for both air quality and water quality. So for air quality, for example, $45 million, which is pretty much makes up that Delta is one-time investments made towards EV rebates and medium and heavy duty charging infrastructure. Okay. Um, similar story in water quality with, um, other fund limitation associated with ARPA for on-site assistance that we always knew was going to phase out, and some other uh, other one-time expenditures. Um, the the governor's budget does include some proposed um, reductions or across the board changes and assumptions that could result in reductions, but nothing that is so significant that you would see it on the chart here. Oh, okay. um, yeah, and I and also a reminder, yeah, just kind of back to process that, you know, we're of course evaluating those reductions really carefully, as is the legislative fiscal office and the members of this. Yeah, great, great question. Um, I think now we'll we'll just move on to a little walkthrough of each of the program areas with um, kind of a little deeper dive and what is in governors what what from the agency request budget carried forward into the governor's budget and also an update on our uh, legislative priorities for each program area. So next slide, please. The first is for agency management. We saw three packages included in the governor's recommended budget. The first enhances funding and support for environmental justice work within the department. Um, of course, we're very excited to see that in the budget. And then um, two other packages that, you know, that are uh, just really important in terms of the agency's ability to kind of support our programmatic work. One uh, authorizes a number of positions in agency management, you know, HR, IT, financial services, uh, positions that help make sure that you know, the trains are running on time at DEQ. And the other are positions really intended to um, increase our ability to apply for and manage federal grants 
Director Feldman said that, of course, will be a lot of opportunities on the horizon. And, um, we want to make sure we are positioning the agency and really the, the state in some instances to, to benefit from those opportunities. Next slide, please. For air quality, um, uh, legislative and budget priorities are the same. Both priorities need a, a budget action and a bill. So one is stabilization of the Title V permitting program. Um, the, the legislation authorizes a fee increase and the budget action restores positions that would otherwise be cut if uh, fees are not increased. And the other, pack, the other um, kind of issue area is community climate investments. You'll remember when you adopted the climate protection program, one program element is community climate investments, a way for regulated entities to um, procure additional uh, compliance instruments by working with a third party who then invests in uh, projects that reduce reliance on fossil fuels. So the bill authorizes a fee increase towards those third parties that funds four positions at DEQ to provide oversight and, and auditing of that system. Both of those bills are still in the House Climate, uh, Energy and Environment Committee where they started. Um, I, and uh, we'll know today that uh, when they'll be posted for a work session, that's the, the first vote they need to kind of move on through the process. Uh, next slide. So for land quality on the, on the budget side, um, First two packages authorize additional positions, but um, rely on existing revenue to continue to implement Oregon's Recycling Modernization Act and also strengthen our materials management program. The third package um, makes a limited duration position permanent uh, for our underground storage tank program. On the legislative side, um, we had we have two bills, one to sunset the dry cleaner program and the other to modernize our e-cycles program. Um, both of these bills have moved out of committee um, uh, with, with really widespread support. Um, the dry cleaner program uh, already has passed the House floor and is on to the Senate and we're waiting for the floor vote on the e-cycles modernization bill. Next slide, please. I'm gonna hand it off to Ryan to cover water. Thanks, Matt. Um, good morning, Chair George, Vice Chair Barrasso, members of the commission. Uh, for the record, my name is Ryan Hoof. I'm the policy and legislative analyst for water quality programs here at DEQ. Uh, I was gonna start with the legislative priorities. Um, and for water, uh, three out of the four legislative concepts that we had uh, pursued for this session were given the, the go ahead from the governor's office. Uh, the first of those, uh, House Bill 3195, seeks to expand uh, the eligibility criteria for um, accessing this fund. Uh, we anticipate that this expansion uh, so that it includes all public agencies, uh, not just those with the authority to operate wastewater facilities. Um, that this change would uh, benefit particularly some small communities around the state that are seeking financing solutions uh, for infrastructure work. Uh, for example, for supporting land conservation efforts um, uh, or other watershed protections, uh, particularly that serve um, and protect their, their source areas for drinking water. Uh, this bill passed out of committee last week and yesterday uh, actually passed um, out of the, the full house uh, with a nearly unanimous vote of support. So really happy to see um, the, the strong bipartisan support for, for this concept. Um, the second one, House Bill 3208, um, would seek to expand your authority um, to uh, provide annual uh, fee increases of up to 3% uh, for a broader range of water quality programs. Um, you currently have this authority and exercise this authority around our NPDES and um, WPCF permitting, uh, but there's a number of other water quality programs that rely on uh, fee revenue um, that do not uh, have that authority for incremental small increases to uh, account for um, you know, inflationary costs to support the current service levels of the program. Uh, so this bill would expand that to include programs such as our uh, 401 certification uh, dredge and fill work, uh, our UIC program, um, our operator certification program, as well as some of our on-site direct service fees. Uh, this bill was successfully voted out of committee yesterday and will move to the House floor uh, next week. Uh, House Bill 3207 um, seeks to revise the manner in which domestic well testing results uh, associated with real estate transactions get transmitted uh, to state authorities. 
this data is already required to be collected um, uh, and should be providing valuable information for us about the quality of groundwater um, in, in particular areas around the state. Um, but recent in, uh, studies have indicated that less than 10% of the data is actually being submitted uh, to state authorities. Um, so we're seeking to, to alter the way that that gets transmitted, hoping that that'll result in a, in a dramatic improvement. Um, this bill had been scheduled for a public hearing in the House Agriculture Just Land for a Use. Oh. Uh, I think uh, Commissioner Addington has a question for you. Yeah, R Ryan, just on 3207, I wonder if you could just give me a little more about how this changes what's already, I, I think I heard you say already required. How does this change that? Yeah, so it, it, it doesn't change who has to collect um, these results. It still requires uh, uh, property owners or sellers uh, to test their water uh, and provide those results to the uh, potential buyer within 90 days after the, the sale of the property. Um, the, the current law requires that they submit that data also to OHA at the time that they share it with the prospective buyer. Um, we feel that there's things happening in terms of that transmission process that's resulting in such a low reporting rate um, to OHA. And so what we're proposing is that the, the accredited labs who already are doing this testing, um, that they be required to share that data with DEQ uh, through an electronic uh, reporting process so it would be more efficient. Um, and that, that through that process, we'd, we'd see a greater reporting rate. So it's not changing who has to report in any way, shape, or form. Thanks. Um, thank you. Um, so yes, this bill was scheduled for, for a public hearing about 10 days ago and was pulled from the agenda um, kind of at the last minute. Um, so we're continuing to engage in discussions uh, about the value of this data, uh, both from a public health standpoint and an environmental uh, management standpoint, and are hopeful that it still may get a hearing, um, but are awaiting for, for further determination from committee leadership. Um, moving on to, to budget topics related to water Just quality. Just one minute, Ryan. Oh. Uh, Leah, you had something? Thank you, Chair George. Yeah, I just want to emphasize that a little bit um, uh, since we were just on that House bill and just say, I think, you know, everybody has heard about a lot of the groundwater issues that we are trying to manage um, in, in various areas of the state. I think mostly folks are hearing about the lower Umatilla Basin right now, but, um, you know, having the information is really important when we talk to interested parties across the spectrum, that's where the conversation starts is what information do we have? What data do we have? Where, you know, where, where is this or that coming from? So I just wanna emphasize that this is a law that's already on the books and we don't have a way of using the data because only about 10% is actually being reported. This would be a great mechanism to, you know, further be able to bring that information to the table um, when we have folks from, across the spectrum who want to discuss this and, and work on this issue. So I just wanted to emphasize that um, a bit more, but thanks, Ryan. Thank you, Director Felden. That's actually a perfect lead in, I think, to talking about a couple of the budget priorities that the governor's recommended budget has identified. Um, policy option package 126 um, would provide some general fund support uh, for us to improve our groundwater management efforts, uh, particularly with some focus around that lower Umatilla Basin area um, that, that Director Felden just mentioned. Um, it includes a groundwater coordinator position. Um, it's kind of a restoration of a position we used to have but no longer have with the agency. Uh, it also would provide a position uh, focused on uh, agronomy, uh, soil science work, so that we can, um, in our permitting efforts, uh, have a, a better uh, technical approach and understanding about how we uh, approach land application and those types of activities as part of our permitting. Uh, and it also includes the uh, some funding, some contract service dollars for the development and refinement of a hydrogeological uh, conceptual model for the lower Umatilla Basin. And this is part of a, a multi-agency process um, that's been underway for a while with OSU, um, and also it's the uh, continuation of a uh, ODA legislative package um, that was funded last session. Um, in addition, there's a, a, a third position, a part of this package that would also um, provide needed support around harmful algal bloom uh, assessment activities uh, with our agency. Um, so generally under this umbrella of protecting drinking water sources, this package 126. 
Um, package 129 also provides general fund uh, enhancements for the agency, particularly to provide our water quality division with some dedicated staffing capacity for grant development, uh, as well as support for grant and contract administration. Um, this is really, um, we view this as being critical for our ability to pursue and implement enhanced federal funding opportunities. Uh, the last two bullets on this slide related to budget priorities are really um, about our clean water SRF program, uh, and these do not in involve new money. Um, this is really about other fund expenditure limitation. Um, policy option package 162 just continues a, um, a package and a project that started last biennia around upgrading the software um, related to loan management of this program. Uh, which is nearly complete. We just need some extra limitation to, to, to fin finish that project here uh, early in the next biennia. And then the policy option packages 181 and 191 uh, are about um, providing us with the um, uh, capabilities through limitation uh, regarding uh, debt service and, and bond obligation funds that provide us the ability to provide the state match component um, to meet federal capitalization grants um, that we get as, uh, in association with the, the Clean Water SRF program. Um, without this package, DEQ would, not, would have to decline um, roughly $35 million per federal fiscal year in federal grants, and um, the impact would be less money that we'd be able to pass through to communities for their infrastructure needs. Um, so that's the extent of um, the legislative and budget priorities specific to DEQ. Um, I, I will just close by noting that there, there's really a lot happening um, in terms of discussions in the legislature around water right now. Um, we're, we're at close to 100 water-related bills that we're tracking. Um, we've already received roughly a dozen um, requests for fiscal impact statements around bills that are not even our own uh, in terms of how it would affect the agency's activities. Um, a lot of discussion uh, brewing around a lot of different water-related topics, uh, whether it's um, CAFOs, um, PFAS and biosolids, reuse work, uh, wildfire impacts on water quality, um, activities related to our on-site um, permitting program and other permitting programs, and drought. Um, there's there's a, a drought package you know, that's being developed by the House Agricultural Land Use um, and Water Committee. Um, that was uh, discussed and presented yesterday involving a lot of potential funding, but of course it's a policy committee and not necessarily um, connected yet with the ways and means. So just want to leave you with that to let you know that there's a lot that we're working on um, and I'd be happy to answer any questions um, uh, or we can pass it back to Matt who will sort of close it out, I think with sort of timelines and, and next steps here in the legislative process. Thank you. Thanks, Ryan. Uh, next, next slide, please. So I think we'll just end with uh, kind of reminding you of some of the key milestones ahead here. The, the next um, big one is DEQ's budget hearing, the week of March 27th. That is where the agency introduces itself to our budget subcommittee and briefs them on the governor's recommended budget and our work more generally. Uh, that's three days of prepared testimony by the agency and the fourth day is the opportunity for the, the public to speak to that committee about their priorities. Um, April 4th is the first significant um, process deadline during the legislative session. That is when bills, um, for the most part, need to have been worked out of their committee of origin in order to stay alive. Typically, see um, the a big narrowing uh, of, of legislation at that point in terms of what's going to continue to be worked on for the remainder of session. May 17th is the final revenue forecast, and that's the most significant one because it's the one that the legislature has to use in terms of um, producing their final budget for the state. So that's something that um, everyone will be watching for. And then finally, June 25th is the date by which the legislature under the Constitution must adjourn, and that's uh, exactly 100 days from today, if anyone's counting. <laughs> So um, yeah, that's uh, that's what we have for you this morning, Commission. Happy to answer any other questions you have today. Great. Well, we are doing well on time, um, so we have a few minutes for questions. Uh, I'll go ahead and and kick us off with a question that I often ask when we get this presentation. 
Um, so we have done, DEQ has done a lot of work um, with our sister agencies, uh, the Department of Agriculture and the Department of Forestry over the last uh, several years with new um, memorandums of, of agreement uh, that in many ways are seeking to get towards TMDL implementation. And of course, um, we've often heard in the past that a limitation uh, sometimes for, or at least one of the uh, limitations of those agencies to be able to kind of partner and contribute to getting to implementation has been, has been budgetary limitations and not having the staff to do that. So one concern of mine is that those agencies are either getting or being you know, able to have the capacity to do that additional work to really move towards TMDL implementation. So um, while that's a bit out of you know, DEQ's budget, I think it, it still directly affects the work that we've committed to together. So do either of you have any sense of whether or not those agencies are in line to, to get the resources they need to be that partner that we've discussed in, in moving forward with TMDL implementation? Ryan. Yeah, I can go ahead and take that. Thank you, Chair George. Um, I don't have the all the details of those other agencies' uh, budgets at my fingertips. I, I can say that um, I'm aware that there weren't significant reductions, particularly to the, the programmatic areas that are most um, closely related to the work that, that you're referencing, um, either at ODA or at ODFW. Um, I know that there were uh, packages, um, policy option packages recommended or requested by both of the agencies that I believe would really help uh, support their ability to um, further pursue and um, uh, implement the type of work in, related to TMDLs. Um, I don't think most of those were included in the in the GRB. Um, however, I can say that I've been a part of multiple discussions where they continue to be uh, acknowledged um, in various circles about um, the importance of that work. Um, so I think that that's an active area of discussion here uh, at this point in the session when there's a lot of um, messaging about things that um, the governor's office may be continuing to talk and, and look at Obviously, they were um, having to get their their feet under them pretty quickly, um, you know. And there's some recognition that um, in discussions about um, openness of what may have been missed or what may be able to be swapped out in terms of um, that balanced budget of the GRB. So I'll just say there's active discussion. Um, and apologies, I don't have those details, but we can get those to you. Well, that's completely understandable, uh, Ryan. Thank you. Uh, so again, I'll just reiterate, uh, you know, my belief that uh, this is critically important for us to be able to in implement those agreements that were captured in, in the agreements that, that we've worked so hard with those sister agencies on it. And I can just say, you know, hey, as, as one citizen commissioner, if a voice to that end is helpful to either of our sister agencies, uh, I'd be more than happy to talk to, to anyone or to attend a hearing and express support for those if that would be helpful in in any way. Uh, Director Felden. Thank you, Chair. First of all, thanks for that um, offer. That's definitely noted. Um, and I, I would just add to this that I think um, there's, you know, definitely we've been having these conversations for a long time and um, probably feels like um, some things need to be happening, happening sooner than later. But I, I, what I think that MOUs and MOAs do also is um, they also can be a support over time for the need for a request for funding. So, you know, it can kind of go both ways, right? We need funding to, to do this work, but I think as um, we continue to work with our sister agencies and go through that process that we've developed in terms of TMDL implementation, it makes clearer for them um, where they need to be focusing and, and perhaps a future ask um, of the legislature. So I think there's um, probably some good symbiosis that can happen as we progress forward in TMDL implementation and, and budgets. Yeah, thank you for that, Leah. I really appreciate those words. Uh, and, you know, budgets are always, always challenging, right? There's never as many resources as everybody wants. But, you know, it, it, sitting in our seat uh, at the commission table, and you know, receiving those briefings and receiving those, you know, for example, memos from the Department of Justice, you know, that explain that it is largely left to our sister agencies to do the implementation side 
uh, for those you know, areas of land management to agriculture in their areas of management, to forestry in their areas of management. If it's largely left to those agencies to do implementation, then they, they have to be able to do it, right? Because DEQ, the way it's set up now, can't. It's not, it's not DEQ's role. But um, then that requires that those agencies are able to do it. And so uh, just as somebody who's worked with you over the last couple of years on these new agreements, um, you know, we can't get there from here unless those agencies can do those jobs. It's, it's not fair to delegate that responsibility for implementation of state rules and frankly, also our federal de delegation of the Clean Water Act. Right. If that's how we implement the Clean Water Act in Oregon, then we have to be able to do it. So I don't mean to, to belabor the point, but I do actually think it's quite critical. And again, just if there's any way I can help, I, I'd be happy to. Ryan. Yeah, thank you, Chair George. Um, my comments had been in response to you know, the status of the that budget development moving forward, but uh, I was remiss in, in noting that uh, you know, the Department of Forestry did recently receive significant new re resources as a result of the private forest accord, and a lot of those re resources do tie specifically to water quality work. Um, so we are seeing them being able to ramp up uh, some base staffing that we really believe is going to contribute greatly to, to the work in this arena. So I just wanted to make sure I pointed that out as well. Thanks very much. I know all these conversations will continue and we'll be hearing a great deal more about the session. All right, do we have maybe one last question, commissioners, on this topic? No. All right, thank you all for a great presentation and for the tremendous amount of work you're doing now and will be doing uh, over the next couple of months. So thank you all. Thank you. All right, we are ready for our update on the Upper Yaquina TMDL development. Welcome, Jennifer. Right. Good morning, Chair George and members of the commission. I'm just, I'm also just checking Jean Foster is going to be joining me. So I'm just looking for, can't see everybody all at once. Just want to make sure he's with us as well. Jennifer, I don't see him quite yet. Oh, yes, I do. I see him Perfect. now. Perfect. Okay. Wonderful. Okay. It looks like it looks like we're here. Oh, but Jean, we can't hear you. Harry, do we need to do anything to I'm I'm working on it just one second. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. I, if it works, I can go ahead and get us going while we're figuring out Jean's audio. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, um, anyway, I'll just start over. Just want to say good morning again, um, Chair George and members of the commission. My name is Jennifer Weigel. I'm the Water Quality Administrator. Um, and as you know, we are here to provide you an update about the work that the agency has been undertaking related to the Upper Yaquina River watershed and the TMDL efforts there. Um, as you can see, Jane Foster, who's our watershed management um, section manager, is here to join me as well. Um, I'm going to kick us off in the first part of the presentation and then we'll be turning it over to him. Um, next slide, please. And so, just to orient folks in terms of what we're going to be talking about today. He said, I'm going to I'm going to take the first few slides, which include a bit of a um, TMDL kind of process and approach refresher um, and a little bit about kind of, you know, the overall process that we're taking um, in doing this TMDL via a rulemaking and where we are with that. Um, I'll turn it over to Jean to talk more about kind of you know, we're, what's what all the particular things that are um, existing within this watershed that are important for us to be thinking about and the work that we're doing to evaluate things along the watershed setting, land uses, and the two pollutants that this TMDL, which are focused on, which is bacteria and, and dissolved oxygen, how we've conducted those analyses, shared that information um, with um, local um, landowners, as well as designated management agencies and the rulemaking advisory committee. Um, and then just kind of where we are in terms of, um, you know, active discussions on the development of this TMDL, how we're kind of the, the topics that are continuing to be focused on and where we are in terms of next step. Um, we are just to kind of put a 
a, a high level marker on the process. We are still working on the TMDL. And so, you know, we still have a little more work to do on that before it goes out for public notice and comment. So just kind of to orient folks at a very high level as to where we sit with, with this TMDL. Um, so next slide, please. So um, I think you've probably seen this before, but just kind of a kind of a base orienting slide about where all this work fits in the overall process. Uh, again, this is obviously much simplified, but when we talk about TMDLs, you know, we are looking at, you know, first we do the standards, then we look at data. Is it attaining? Um, and if it's not attaining, that's where we enter with the, the total maximum daily load process, which is really a, a watershed evaluation of current sources and loading and what kinds of reductions are needed in order to achieve water quality standards over time through actions by um, local entities. Um, as part of that TMDL process, we also have um, what's called a water quality management plan. Um, and so that water quality management plan lays out the expectations and um, direction um, to the designated management agencies for what's needed in order to um, reduce levels of pollutants and, and ultimately achieve the water quality standards. Um, so that's the space that we're in right now. And then of course, there's all the little, those little boxes in the bottom left-hand corner of that blue box, which is are all the different ways in which um, the efforts are done um, and different types of funding sources and other things that come to bear in terms of on the ground implementation over time. Okay, next slide, please. Um, so um, as many folks know, there's a lot of different types of analyses and Gene is gonna cover some of those that we do, but just, we thought this schematic, we've used different versions of this in the past. We think it's sometimes kind of helpful when we think about, you know, how do we actually approach TMDLs? So starting on the left-hand side, you know, when we have um, a water body that has more loading of a pollutant, um, and causing it to exceed the water quality standard, you know, that's where we're starting from. So that left-hand side, we have a standard that's set at a certain level. We have more pollutants than, than what can um, uh, be present um, and still meet the standard. And so then the next, the next phase of this is really looking at, so what sources do we have in the watershed? So typically, you know, we lump those kinds of things into three broad categories. So point sources, those sources that get permits from us, um, you know, what's coming from background, so, um, you know, depending on the pollutant that we're talking about, it could be from soils, it could be from, you know, solar radiation, it could be from, you know, there's lots of different ways in which we see background. And then there's the non-point sources. So I know everybody here is very familiar with, with what those include. So typically those are kind of the three big bins that we're looking at and understanding what do we know about what's um, the sources that are, that are entering into those into that watershed and how much of each of those are um, contributing to those exceedances about the standard. And then ultimately in the TMDL, when we actually go to do that, we look at, well, how much do those sources need to be reduced? And then we also add um, a couple other little pieces is one is we add a margin of safety. So just recognizing that our analyses aren't gonna be um, uh, precise down to the, precise down to the very, um, you know, tiny little bit, but we also then add reserve capacity, recognizing that things change within a watershed over time. We may have communities that are growing. We may have new industries or businesses that want to locate. And so we want to ensure that there's a little bit in this overall, you know, pollution budget that can accommodate for some of that growth over time. So typically that is how we approach TMDL allocations at a very high level when we are doing this work. Um, and then the um, next slide, please. Again, just kind of a brief schematic just to show you where we're at in terms of um, this overall process. Um, all of the, the loops you see on the left-hand side is all the work that we do on the technical side, talking to local folks, more technical work, um, talking to EPA, um, and then back around in that circle again. Um, we've also then weave in, in this instance, a rule advisory committee. We are not yet done with that process. We have another meeting scheduled with that group, but at the same time, we're here. We want to give you uh, kind of a, a window into the work that we've been doing um, both in terms of um, all the, you know, kind of more technical work and conversations, but also with the 
uh, rule advisory committee and, and those various um, policy aspects and you know being able to share information with that group around both how the rule language is being developed and getting input on potential for fiscal impact um, impacts related to this to this work as well. Um, we have one more rule rulemaking advisory committee scheduled um, for next week, so we're not quite done with that process. And then we'll be looking at going out to, to public comment and doing all of those other traditional parts of our rulemaking process after that. And you see in there that we also, of course, as part of that rule adoption, will be coming back to you um, for that um, for our recommendations around that. Um, so with that, let's see. Um, we will go to the next slide. And I'm just going to do a brief kind of like watershed orientation. So we are talking about the upper Yaquina. Um, so this is out on the coast. You can see in the, the bottom left hand window, you know, this this part of um, the Yaquina watershed does not um, drain directly into um, the estuary and coastal waters, but is rather a little bit further up in the watershed. Um, it's a subset of the Siletz Yaquina subbasin. Um, we carved off this small watershed um, to really kind of be able to focus in on and be able to take something that was a little bit more bite-sized to get action on um, some of the longstanding impairments that we've seen through our um, integrated report around um, bacteria and dissolved oxygen impairments. Um, the outline in pink in that larger, um, in the larger uh, map there is the outline of the upper Yaquina, um, largely it, it, within um, Lincoln County. Um, it is largely, um, it's very rural. And so you'll, you'll hear Gene talk about kind of what that means in terms of sources as he gets into some of his more technical um, uh, overview in just a moment. Um, Let's see, um, the size of this just for scale, it's, it drains a land area of approximately 83 square miles. Um, like I said, the majority of this watershed is in Lincoln County and with a small part of the Eastern portion extending into Polk and Benton counties. Um, we, the general topography here is, um, you know, along the streams, we have um, um, some flatter um, uh, adjacent landscapes next to the streams, but we also have narrow valleys of forested hills. So um, as I turn this um, next slide over to Gene, he's going to be able to, he's going to talk to you a little bit more um, first about how we uh, approach some of our analyses, but also more about what does that landscape look like in terms of within the watershed, in terms of land ownership and activities that are occurring within the watershed that are of interest and, and focus for this TMDL in particular. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to Jean. Do you have audio, Jean? Commissioners, this is Jennifer Flint. Uh, we're going to need just a moment to determine what the issue is with Jean Foster's audio. Understood. These things happen. Um, Gene, I'm wondering if you can, if you have your phone handy, if you could dial in, you could put all your Zoom settings on mute. Yeah, sorry, commissioners. We're seeing him with his microphone off and his camera on, so I'm not quite sure why he's not able to speak. Chair George, Commissioners, this is Jennifer Flint again. Um, we'll give him a moment to uh, call in by phone if possible, but we are communicating with him by text at the moment. Okay, thanks for the update. Yeah, go ahead. Let's give it a couple more minutes. Sometimes we can finagle our way, way through these things. So uh, we're happy to do that. Thank you, Chair George.
Um, if Jean's okay, I do have some notes on this slide, so I could cover this one. Does that work for you, Jean? Okay. And then if I need a lifeline, I know we've you're working on it, and I think we've also got Alex Alex Liverman who's who's participating. So we've got we've got a few different routes that we can go if this continues to be a challenge. But um, pipe up if you think it might be fixed or you want to try your audio. And I'll go ahead and cover. I'll start with this slide and I'll check in with you. Okay. Um, so any, um, this slide, we were not going to walk through in detail. Um, there's a lot of information here, but really what we wanted to outline first for um, the dissolved oxygen impairment and the operator coena, um, to first note that the first step really here is, is to pull together data and information around the impairment. And so in that first step, what we're doing is, is we're pulling together data that met kind of the, the qualifications we set for the usability and applicability of data in the watershed. So that includes data not that not only that DEQ has, but also data that other folks in the watershed um, have that, that's relevant. So in this instance, we had data from the Siletz tribe, watershed council, soil and water conservation districts, and of course things and data that we had ourselves. Um, and so we bring all that together as long, along with other kinds of information and characteristics about the watershed that include kind of physical characteristics as well as in-stream water quality characteristics. Um, we then use um, different types of models. Um, so again, there's different types of models here that, that get brought in. And again, I'm not going to explain those exactly what they all are, but there's a number of different ways that look at, you know, hydrology and landscape characteristics. Um, and land ownership um, that look at what are the activities in the basin and, and looking at, um, uh, you know, kind of to estimate, in this instance, estimating watershed loads of nutrients, which um, can affect levels of dissolved oxygen, um, the direct input of solar radiation to the river, which can affect um, the rate at which we see algal growth when those nutrients and other conditions are present. And also um, properties of um, the channel form, which can also influence how um, dissolved oxygen exchanges within the river and with the atmosphere. Um, we also use um, LIDAR, which is um, a type of remote sensing analysis that tells us what types of vegetation and topography conditions that we have. And then we also use models um, to calculate you know, how much riparian shading we have, which affects that solar radiation. Um, and then also the fraction of the of the stream channel that's exposed to the sky. So again, that's another way to look at um, riparian conditions and understand how much of that solar radiation is actually reaching the surface of the stream. Um, Jean. Yes, Jean, how are we doing? Oh, your phone is muted, I think. If that phone number is you, that's muted. How about now? All right, sorry about that. And I don't know how to lower my hand and um, on the phone. So we'll just leave it up for now. And then when I turn it off, that'll be that. So Chair George, members of the commission, Director Felden, Gene Foster, manager of the watershed management section at the EQ headquarters at those TNMDLs and non-point source work. And sorry, Jennifer, I'm not quite sure how far along you were on this slide here. Um, I believe I hit the points that we wanted to hit on the on that slide. All right, great. Um, the only thing that then that I'll add is that we do we collect a lot of data, we do a lot of analysis um, using standard uh, techniques and methods uh, that are used by EPA and other state agencies uh, in Oregon, across the Pacific Northwest and the US for development of TMDLs um, that are able to get us to where we need to be for um, the, the various components and required elements for TMDLs. So let's go on to the next slide then. So for, um, for the upper Yaquina TMDL, and this is a picture of the Yaquina River above Chitwood, and you can kind of see those kind of greenish things in the in the middle of the river there. That's uh, algal masses, paraphyton growing in the river. And um, our analysis that we did through what uh, Jennifer had just walked you through and the use of the data and information 
Um, this, that analysis was for dissolved oxygen. And through that analysis, we were able to identify some uh, pollutants and factors that are important for controlling dissolved oxygen in the Upper Yaquina River. Um, dissolved oxygen in the Upper Yaquina River is influenced by uh, total phosphorus, which was one of the pollutants that uh, you'll see that we allocated in the, uh, when we go to the next slide. And also, um, light, not so much temperature, but light. And but the component that is um, important for blocking light, vegetation, providing shade to keep primary productivity lower, um, the uh, primary productivity lower um, in the river is important. However, that same shade, we do have temperature impairments in in this part of the Upper Yaquina River. The temperatures are too warm there, but we focused on dissolved oxygen. And as it turns out, the, um, the shade that will be important for blocking light or uh, meeting dissolved oxygen along with the total phosphorus allocation are also going to be helpful in um, blocking solar radiation that heats, that heats the water. So we think that um, even though the TMDL isn't being developed to address those impairments, when we get to implementation uh, later on in the in the presentation, we'll see that uh, um, a lot of of the uh, lack of shade is due to non-point sources, <clears throat> and we expect that that shade not only will help dissolved oxygen achieve our dissolved oxygen standard, but also um, um, bring temperatures down as well to um, help with the temperature impairments. The dissolved oxygen, um, we have, um, it, uh, this is again uh, a bar, the, the, two, the two figures here are the bar charts similar to what you saw earlier um, that uh, Jennifer presented. Solar radiation, this is um, the actual pollutant that um, uh, is uh, the light that's causing the uh, increase in photosynthesis and the impairments that we're seeing in relation to dissolved oxygen. And then also phosphorus is the other pollutant on the right-hand side. And this figure here shows us the some of the required elements for uh, when we do TMDLs. The excess load, there is a 76% reduction needed in, um, in um, the solar radiation, and that will be achieved through uh, revegetation, replanting, and getting shade. The, um, along the left bar there under the solar radiation, um, you see the water quality standard uh, that we have set for dissolved oxygen and the pollutant loading capacity. This loading capacity is um, assigned to the non-point sources and background. Background for us in our, in our definitions and our administrative rules for TMDLs, Background can be either natural sources or un uncontrolled anthropogenic sources. And this is where climate change is going to start coming in, is how climate change is going to, or going to, is affecting the state of Oregon and our aquatic resources. <clears throat> and so we're starting to roll in climate change and background as a background source into our, um, into our analysis here. And so, this excess load that we see here, most of it's going to be addressed through revegetation and providing shade. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about the climate change uh, later on. Phosphorus is the other allocation that we have for dissolved oxygen. Phosphorus from soils, um, eroding soils, uh, perhaps from manure from livestock, um, um, also from on-site systems in certain areas. Uh, can be a significant source or were identified as a source of phosphorus to the area um, based on our analysis of 50% reduction is needed. And again, the pollutant loading capacity is, is what's allocated and a, a portion of that is going to Oregon Department of Transportation through their MS4, that's 1%. Um, failing septic systems, they also get a part of the, um, the loading capacity. And, but the majority is going to livestock and then runoff from roads and, and silver culture. And we do have some reserve capacity for, for future growth. And then there's also background sources. So that's the breakdown on the required elements. And if we can go to the next slide, that'd be great. 
for our bacteria analysis, um, we took a, a different approach um, because of the type of data we had. And this was a more direct approach with dissolved oxygen, as you saw from the slide a couple of slides ago, there's a lot of factors that can affect dissolved oxygen. And sometimes it takes a mechanistic model to understand those, um, those factors that are affecting dissolved oxygen. But bacteria analysis, it can be a much uh, more straightforward analysis in that we have bacteria data that's collected um, during different flow events. And we use those flows times the bacteria concentration to come up with a load. And um, we're able to use those flows in our analysis to identify, are we seeing high bacteria concentrations during high flow events, which would indicate um, precip um, in this system, especially because, um, because of the way the system is, high, uh, high flows are, are more linked to precipitation events and runoff events. So bacteria exceedances during those high flow events would indicate that the sources are from uh, those type of sources from runoff, <clears throat> either bacteria run, running off um, from manure or, or those kinds of things, maybe roads as well. Bacteria exceedances that occur during low flow events, those are non-runoff events, and those could indicate those are on-site systems, septic systems that are that are the primary source. And so we're able to use these low duration curves, not just for coming up with um, our required elements of the TMDL, but to also indicate what the sources are. And that's what we do here. You see outputs. We use this as a source assessment, the loading capacity, and the excess loads. And then we do the allocations and the surrogate measures for that. Uh, next slide, please. And here we have a, a similar slide that we've had for the other two on showing the bacteria concentrations and the allocations. We have it for the low flow events um, because we did see some exceedances during the low flow events. And then we have all other flows. And these other flows include the, um, the high flow events. So on the left-hand side, the low flow events, you see the excess load that needs to be reduced. What is actually allocated, though, is the loading capacity, that pollutant loading capacity that you see there. And this is um, a, a better way of expressing it rather than we have to express the excess load because it's a required element for TMDLs. How we implement those, where are we seeing those exceedances and those excess loads, as a, and then we can focus our, our um, implementation efforts but to figure out whether or not we're meeting the standard or not, we're using the loading capacity in our bacteria standard for that. Again, on the right-hand side is all other flows, and um, you can see that there's a little bit of difference in the allocations there um, that, that we have. So this was the approach that we took for bacteria. Uh, next slide, please. So now that we have our required elements, uh, for our TMDL, we have the standards, the pollutants, the uh, excess load, the loading capacities, the allocations. Now we want to start talking about how we how we implement the TMDLs, and this is where the rubber hits the road for um, getting things done in the watershed to um, uh, achieve water quality standards and. Um, there has been a lot of action and activity over the years at certain times in the area. So um, I think, though, that the analysis that we've done here is going to help us in the implementation actions. And in this case, we're going to be talking about uh, how we go about identifying land use and jurisdiction for non-point sources of pollutants. Because um, um, Next slide, please. Here we have a land use map. And the land use, and this is a land use map. Uh, well, it's a map of the Upper Yaquina with land use overlaid on it. And you can see that there's a little bit of county land, there's some tribal land. Uh, Oregon Department of Agriculture um, is responsible, is the uh, designated management agency for agricultural lands and agricultural activity. There's also Oregon Department of Forestry that's also responsible, and they have private. Uh, forest, and then also ODF for public forests. This is uh, state forest land. And there, 
ODF is re the DMA responsible for implementation for, for private and state forests. Oregon Department is transportation and then roads and then Bureau of Land Management has a small section as well. And if we stop there, we could say, well, the Upper Uquina watershed is 87% forest and 8% agriculture, roads and residential. So it looks like just based on land use that uh, forestry is the, well, forestry is the dominant land use for the entire watershed. Uh, next slide, please. However, when we go to the riparian area, and it's the riparian areas that typically have the most influence on water quality in a watershed, the further away you get from a stream or a water body, the less influence uh, a source typically has on water quality. So understanding the who has the riparian area jurisdiction is very important for understanding which riparian areas are going to be the most significant or which DMAs are going to be the most significant given riparian acreage and uh, where restoration should really uh, be focused on. And you can see here from the table on the, on the left, responsible persons, Oregon Department of Agriculture, Oregon Department of Forestry have a little tan outlined on it. And then this is the riparian acreage within 100 feet of the Aquina River. Um, you see 336 acres for Oregon Department of Agriculture and 315 for Oregon Department of Forestry private forest. And then you can see to a lesser extent um, acreage for Lincoln County, the railroad, ODOT, and Bureau of Land Management. And then the percentages um, to the right of that. And so this analysis shows us that most of the riparian acreage the DMA responsible for that is going to be Oregon Department of Agriculture at 41% of the acreage and Oregon Department of Forestry at a um, little over 38% of the acreage. So those are the dominant DMAs as far as riparian acreage. And so this um, helps us to understand who might have the biggest influence. And then the other factor on this is also What's the riparian condition like within those riparian areas for that those DMAs are responsible for? And you can see here that um, in the figure to the right, the y-axis is acreage with vegetation height less than or equal to three feet. And along the x-axis, we have Oregon Department of Agriculture is 120 acres of less than three feet. Um, and so, this would, um, this is getting us to uh, an area that we're starting to understand the amount of riparian acreage that has very short vegetation. ODF, private forest, uh, 60 acres, and then you get into the railroads and ODOT uh, and BLM. They have um, relatively small, it doesn't mean that they don't have responsibilities and aren't going to be required to do something but they, they have a, a small amount compared to the other DMAs. And then Lincoln County has uh, a certain amount of 40 acres. Um, and I will point out that during our technical work group meetings for the upper, well, the technical work group meetings for the mid coast and our local stakeholder advisory committee meetings for the mid coast, we solicited and received input from stakeholders on the type of vegetation and the height of vegetation that should, should be growing along these rivers and streams. So we did the analysis, we solicited input, uh, we made a, a initial first assumptions based on the literature and our own knowledge, but we talked with the soil, the, the folks that are implementers and the folks that, that live and work in that area for getting better information about our analysis. Uh, next slide, please. And so, what we are seeing from our analysis and from some of the work that we we're doing and input from the um, technical work group and the advice and the local stakeholder advisory committee um, was that um, there is grazing impacts in the riparian areas. On the left, you can see a cut bank here, uh, maybe due to the high flows cutting it down, but maybe also due to livestock. And then um, the uh, Reed canary grass and blackberry growing along the streams here that um, are vegetated, but it's not 
not providing the height of vegetation that's needed in order to block the shade for achieving the dissolved oxygen. Uh, next slide, please. We also um, had local stakeholder input on bacteria sources. These were extensive discussions with folks. When we first started out, we had discussions about uh, what type of bacteria sources there are. And um, not surprising, folks uh, mentioned wildlife, birds, waterfowl, elk, also livestock, transportation corridors, uh, and then also failing septic systems. And we did uh, our analysis and provide and providing with input from the technical work groups and the local stakeholder advisory committee meetings. And we identified that in um, in our analysis and based on the input, there's going to be some locations where septic systems are going to be the primary source, and those are the ones that are occurring mostly during low flow events. But livestock, livestock access. Um, are also a very important source. We identified that wildlife is um, based on analysis and input from, from those groups are not a very large source of bacteria to the, um, to, to the watershed. Um, next slide, please. Here and then, so, we, and we're switching back to, to shade now. So, we talked about the riparian area, the land use, and then the riparian jurisdiction and identified Oregon Department of Agriculture and Oregon Department of Forestry as having a lot of responsibility. And then we talked about the amount of vegetation acreage that there was in relation to um, those DMAs. And then we talked about bacteria sources. And one of the ways we can, um, one of the ways we can uh, think about bacteria sources is by breaking up the watershed into source areas. And these source areas, we use the downstream monitoring station as an indicator of the sources of bacteria going up to the next monitoring station. And then that next monitoring station is an indicator of bacteria sources for that, for that part of the watershed going up to the next um, monitoring station. And we work our way up that way. And in some of these locations, such as the, um, um, some of these locations, we have exceedances of bacteria water quality standards during high flows. And we're gonna focus on those uh, sources, such as livestock and livestock runoff, um, for those source areas that indicate high bacteria levels during high flows. And then we're going to focus on Lincoln County and on-site systems uh, for those source areas where low during low flows we have high bacteria standards. And Commissioner okay, Kyle, I see you have your hand raised. Yes, Commissioner Kyle. Thank you. I just have a question um, with regards to interpreting the shade gap legend on this. Um, it's less than 40, 40 to 50, above 50. Could you explain what that is? And is there a, like an ideal shade gap? Chair George, Commissioner Kyle. Yes, this shade gap map is the part, is the modeled part of the stream where we did shade modeling. And so when we do the shade modeling and development of the shade gap map, these tools are gonna to be very helpful in identifying the difference between what our current shade levels are in the stream and what the allocated shade is for dissolved oxygen, for the dissolved oxygen allocation. So you can see here from this map, um, there are some areas of the stream where we're very close or meeting the shade allocations. Those are the, the, the green dots. And then the other extreme are the red dots where there's a large gap between the current shade and what the allocated shade levels are. And by showing those dots and then also overlaying that the yellow is the uh, designated management agency and I believe that's um, Oregon Department of Agriculture, we can identify that in those areas that are yellow with red dots, 
those are going to likely be priority areas that are going to be important for doing restoration actions in those locations. So this shade gap is showing us how much difference there is between what the shade should be and what it currently is. Thank you. Yep. <clears throat> and so um, when we're using these shade gap maps, and so this, and I maybe I should have preferenced this all along. This is what our current understanding is of the conditions of the Upper Yaquina watershed. Um, within the TM, well, within the Water Quality Management Plan part of the TMDL, or maybe within the TMDL uh, required elements itself, if we're going to have uh, language in there that as newer information becomes available, we want to be able to adaptively manage and prioritize restoration actions because um, the data um, that we have, time has passed. This is our current understanding. But if better data comes in or more recent data comes in, we want to be able to say, yes, that's more accurate or that's a, uh, that, that is showing that things are either getting better or are going down and um, that um, and, and that we're um, able to, to adaptively manage for this, um, for, for, this uh, for that newer data coming in. Now the shade gaps, I'll also point out that for the shade gap maps, it's effective shade that, that we're looking at, the percent uh, difference in effective shade. So um, effective shade is the paraphrase, I guess, given um, the shade that's current, the, the vegetation that's currently there and the sun coming over, how much shade is, is the amount of shade that's blocking the solar radiation coming, coming in. So that effect of, and that's based on a percentage. So, um, are we ready to move on? Probably. All right, let's move on. <laughs> you all have heard enough about shade gap maps now. Let's move on. So this, the combination of our of our technical tools for land use and land ownership in relation to potential source non-point sources of pollution um, have given us much better visualization and analytical methods that can potentially be used to help improve the pace and scale of water quality restoration. There's also going to be funding issues and there's also going to be issues on, on landowners and their willingness or unwillingness to do active restoration. Um, we're also in a, in a place where in our division 42 rules, that's our TMDL rules, um, when it comes to implementing TMDLs, there's language in there about the use of existing programs or plans and DEQ making a determination during the TMDL development process on whether those plans are going to be adequate for implementing the TMDL for a DMA to implement the TMDL and its adequacy for achieving the allocations. There's that similar type of language for Oregon Department of Forestry and also Oregon Department of Agriculture. So within the TMDL, the water quality management plan, the water quality management plan section of the TMDL, we're um, providing information about the adequacy of those existing plans to uh, be used as implementation plans for the TMDL and achieving the allocations. We're also using a lot of analysis and reaching out to watershed implementers, folks that like the Soil Water Conservation Districts, Watershed Councils, National Resource Conservation Service, NRCS, for um, potential education and outreach and financial assistance, technical assistance, because as Chair George, you said, DEQ isn't really the experts at what needs to, working with the landowners, those are gonna be other folks, um, the DMAs and those folks that do education, outreach, financial assistance, and technical assistance. And then we're also, because this is being adopted as rule, and probably also because it's just good public policy, 
an evaluation of fiscal impacts and environmental justice and racial equity issues. Um, next slide, please. Go on to the, there we go. So pace and scale. Um, pace and scale, um, we've identified problems in the mid coast and uh, for a long time back in the 1970s, uh, the, when the Clean Water Act was first uh, passed, the states were um, required or took the opportunity to develop water quality management plans and DEQ did this. And we have these for all of the basins from the 1970s. Um, and within those, we identify issues. And it's quite interesting, point sources and flows and too warm a water and um, other pollutant parameter, uh, other water quality parameters and pollutants were identified as problems. Um, in the mid 1990s, this is when the Oregon plan and for salmon and watersheds uh, came about and the Co Oregon Coastal Coho Restoration Initiative in, the, in 1997. Restoration um, funding and actions increased over that time. And um, then, um, then the, the restoration uh, pace began to decline in the 2000s, mid 2000s. And then also in the 2000s, late 2000s, our 319 grant funds got reduced. Um, however, we still, um, there's still funding mechanisms available. And if we can go on to the, to the, next, the next slide, please. One of the ways that we're looking to increase pace and scale is through the our technical tools on uh, on identifying shade gaps uh, for uh, for dissolved oxygen and source areas for total phosphorus and bacteria, and overlaying the jurisdiction on those riparian areas. Um, we're requiring implementation plans for for DMAs, Lincoln County, Oregon Department of Transportation, and also the railroads and BLM. In addition to that, uh, we're also requiring uh, implementation plans for Oregon Department of Forestry and also Oregon Department of Agriculture. We believe that these implementation plans will help identify the gaps that, there, that exist between the current programs and what's needed to achieve the TMDL allocations and give the opportunity or impetus for collaboration in the watershed for ODA, ODF, DEQ, these other DMAs to work with watershed councils, SWCDs, and prioritize restoration and education and outreach. Um, we have been consulting with our with the DMAs, specifically ODA and ODF and ODOT and other DMAs as we're de making these determinations in the TMDL and the TMDL implementation planning. Uh, next slide, please. We also identify, as I mentioned, funding resources. And there is funding available through OWEB, NRCS, and then some of the Clean Water Act. And, and you heard earlier about the Clean Water State Revolving Fund uh, changes that are being made. We're also <clears throat> leveraging these partnerships that we have in the watershed um, to link up what the TMDL needs are with restoration priorities for these funding organizations. And we're leveraging and using existing networks um, that support the local groups, the local landowners, and technical assistance and financial assistance. Uh, next slide, please. Um, we're doing a fiscal impact. There is going to be costs for development of TMDL implementation plans. There's going to be costs associated with uh, uh, restoration actions. It's difficult to um, uh, quantify these ongoing costs based on current uh, um, current information available. We did get input from our, our rural advisory committee during the first two meetings about uh, uh, economic impacts, and we're incorporating that into our fiscal impact statement. We're also share, we're sharing these documents, the administrative rule, the TMDL with the water quality management plan report that'll be uh, 
incorporated by reference into rule as well as the, uh, the technical support documents and we'll be talking about that with the rule advisory committee meeting uh rule advisory committee at the meeting on march 22nd which Gene, is next i wanted week. to ask you a question about uh timing for the submission of the um, implementation plans by the designated management agencies uh, what is the timeline uh, by which they they need to submit uh, uh, their plan. Chair George, um, we you know, with, so short answer is eighteen months after adoption by the EQC of the of the TMDL. Um, okay. Within the water quality management plan, we identify management strategies that the EQ has identified as likely to achieve the allocations. However, the DMAs, when they are developing their TMDL implementation plans, they'll be working with the EQ. They may identify alternative management strategies or additional management strategies that they would put into their implementation plan and use and submit those to the EQ for our action, hopefully approval, because we'll want to be working with them and them working with us. So 18 months after issuing, after adoption of the rule by, by the EQC. Okay, and you haven't gotten any indication from the designated management agencies that they're not going to be able to get that done within that time frame? Chair George, um, there has been some discussion on um, on prioritization of of areas for restoration or doing analysis. Um, so. Within the water quality management plan, there's identification of those management strategies. And if the DMA is accepting of DEQ's analysis, then um, they moving forward with the development of the implementation plan and the priorities is, would be adequate. But if they're wanting to reprioritize, there's still discussions about how to, what's the timing of that additional analysis that the DMAs want to do. Should it be when the TMDL implementation plan is um, submitted in 18 months after issuance, or should it be that a plan to, re to do the prioritization be should be submitted as part of the implementation plan and then occur after that? So those conversations are still ongoing. There's also discussion about what's the timeline for how quickly implementation can occur and when we would achieve the water quality standards. That's understandable. Well, as this goes forward, it'll be interesting to hear. Uh, one of the things that was very explicitly addressed uh, in, in uh, DEQ's recent conversations with the Oregon Department of Agriculture and, and Forestry, uh, and, and I think captured in the new uh, agreements, was that we really wanted to move beyond uh, sister agencies, you know, spending time and resources kind of arguing about each other's data and wanting to redo studies and bring in different data to the table. Um, there was a real effort to identify that as a problem, to say the time for those debates about data is during the TMDL process where everybody is invited to the table. That's the time to bring your data forward and what you want to want to address. So um, I, I hope I hope that those conversations can be resolved well. I think if, and, and I trust that they will, um, if that can't happen, I think it needs to be raised and it needs to be discussed openly because it, this, this is a challenge that we hope to be moving beyond. If we don't see that happening, then I think it's in everybody's best interest to bring it back to the table and say, okay, what, what, is, what needs to happen differently here? So uh, I won't say any further though, because I, I know you need to, to uh, proceed with the presentation. Thank you, Chair George. And we have been having uh, substantive and productive discussions with Oregon Department of Agriculture and Oregon Department of Forestry. Great. Um, next slide, please. Environmental justice and racial equity, um, because this is a rule, um, this is a requirement, but it's also good public policy, even if it was an order. Um, there are communities with potential disadvantages uh, in the Upper Yaquina, um, either age, low income, minority status, um, and we don't believe that they will be disproportionately impacted by TMDL implementation, and we believe that with restoration of water quality and the beneficial uses that are associated to those 
to, to the water quality standards that, that the TMDL is being developed for, that there will be uh, an improvement in the opportunities for these um, for these for these communities. Um, we have been in, we have been engaged <clears throat> with the tribes. We've used their data, been in consultation with them. Well, I won't say consultation; that probably is a legal term. We've been in discussions with them about uh, about the resources and water quality, also with ag, agriculture and forestry, fishery and conservation communities uh, through the local through the rural advisory committee. And before that, the technical work group and the local stakeholder advisory committees. And we believe that water quality is, is an improvement in water quality is going to be helpful to these communities. Um, next slide, please. Next step, so as, you, as we mentioned before, um, rule, our third rural advisory committee uh, next week for the Upper Uquina. Public comment uh, anticipated from uh, May through June of this year. And we'll be summarizing those comments and the final documents for the EQC consideration and requesting rule adoption in September of this year, when then it'll be submitted to EPA for their action. And all along these steps, we have been in communication with EPA about this and have received favorable input and review so far on the Upper Yaquina TMDL. Next slide, please. Here's our schedule for 2023 for the EQC TMDL items. And you'll see that uh, in addition to the Upper Yaquina, we also have in May the, um, well, the Upper Yaquina today. Uh, in May, we have the powder bacteria TMDL, and that's an informational item, and the Willamette and the Sandy Subbasin Temperature TMDL replacement projects that we'll be talking with and giving an informational item with the EQC. September, um, information and decision on the Upper Yaquina. We also anticipate that um, we have uh, a decision on the of uh, putting forward to the EQC uh, decision for the powder bacteria TMDL. And then in November, we are coming to the EQC for the Willamette and Sandy temperature TMDLs for a uh, decision for adoption of, of those TMDLs as rules and an informational item on the coquille. And so through all of these, you'll, you'll see that similar type of data and analysis are being done uh, for these TMDLs um, and and that um, and similar type of issues that should become familiar with you all as as we're working our way um, through the year. And I think that is that. Unless there's something on the next slide. Is next slide uh, questions? Yeah. And sorry, it took me a while to get through this, and with the uh, with the uh, the sound part. No problem. We have all been in that position, so we understand how that goes. Uh, commissioners, do you have any questions or comments on this presentation? Yes, Vice Chair Barrasso. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, um, Jean and, and, and Jennifer. I really appreciate this. Um, and just appreciate the thoroughness that, that, that exists here. I think all of this sounds good and, 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 and I'm tracking and, and it's really helpful to see this now and, and get this dive. And I know we've been expecting this for a little while now, and this has been a work in progress for a while. I think my one question is just looking back to some of the, one of the slides, particularly when <clears throat> you broke down, um, there's a visual on breaking down the, the river stretch uh, into a few different source areas and capturing sort of the monitoring stations and how those reflected on a, a, an area and how that station and the area above it was how you sort of captured what, what, what was playing out in a given source area. I, it's, it's a high level of resolution of data is what it looks like when I see that. I recognize that's not a, a scaled map, but I just, a question overall is we expect to see other TMDLs and know that there are future ones coming. How does this level of data compare to the work that's happening in other basins? Uh, I'm, I'm certainly impressed. And I'm also thinking about, okay, what does it mean to work through TMDLs and, and, and the level of work that's here and, and how do I need to contextualize that for, for other basins when we've got other work coming down? Chair George, uh, Vice Chair Barrasso, um, that's an excellent question. Um, I think it's 
going to be highly variable depending on the given location, such as when we bring <clears throat> the Willamette temperature TMDL to you all for the Willamette subbasins. In the southern Willamette, we're going to have shade gap maps like we just showed for the for the upper Yaquina. Um, but for the middle, for most of the middle, and only a and for only, well, maybe I should do it this way. For the southern Willamette, we're going to have shade gap maps for the like we did for the upper Yaquina to show the different differential between current and allocated shade. Only for a small sections in the middle Willamette and small sections in the lower Willamette. Are we going to have that same visualization? We're going to have uh, uh, shade curves that can be used for those areas. But the vision we currently, and this is part of what we're working on, is to be able to do the shade modeling in larger areas than what we currently have. And so, when um, for for shade gap maps, we're going to have that same resolution for some areas, but not all areas. But we have approaches that we're using for of evaluation of those areas that we'll go through at that time. For bacteria, uh, such as in the powder, we're going to be using load duration curves again and using those same source areas. And we're going to see for the powder that it's um, more dominated by irrigation season than it is by, um, by other factors. So we'll be covering that um, both on source area and seasonality on what the data is. So we'll have bacteria and flow data that we use for identifying what type of flow levels and what type of sources there are. So for bacteria, <clears throat> we'll, we'll have this type of information, um, but for, for shade, it's going to be um, variable, as I said. But that's where we want to go to, though, is having the shade analysis because it's going to be very effective, I think. I've heard recently in conversations and talking with landowners that in-stream water quality, if you have, as an example, in-stream water quality, high bacteria levels in an area, landowners, and rightfully so, say, how do you know it's coming from my area? How do you know it's not coming from an upstream source, urban stormwater or something like that? Um, with bacteria, it's going to be kind of difficult. but with shade, we're going to be able to say, this is what the condition is. And so it's going to be pretty persuasive, I think. Well, great. Thank you all very much. Um, and we know we'll be seeing more of you before long uh, on this work and more. Uh, we are just a little bit overdue uh, to take a break. Uh, commissioners, what do you say to a quick five minute break? Yeah? All right. Let's do it. Um, well, see, let's see here. It's actually almost 1110. So let's uh, reconvene at 1115. See you there. Chair George, commissioners, this is Jennifer Flint, and we are off the record pausing recording. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, welcome back, everyone. We'll just make sure that we have the director back as well. There she is. All right, next up is our commissioner reports. Uh, who would like to start us off? So many eager hands flying up. Well, one thing I know that, um, or at least I believe, has been going on that it might be worth just mentioning is I think we had um, in progress a reshift of our OWEB seat. Uh, so uh, Commissioner Kyle, maybe you can update us on that and, and, and any other uh, items that you think we should be aware of. Sure, well, that was actually what I was going to say. So Greg and I have officially switched over uh, and I will now be the DQ liaison to the OWEB board with the first meeting coming up here in a couple of weeks, uh, conveniently located in Salem. So Greg, you uh, are missing out there on, uh, on an easy one to get to, uh, but it's gonna be fun to be back involved with, with that group. Um, and then the only other kind of announcement a little bit, and it has to do with the research hat that I wear down here at the university, is that we do have a well water study going on 
um, and we've just expanded recruitment across the state. So previously it was being done down in Jackson County. So you might see uh, some advertisements popping around with my name on them, advertising uh, arsenic, nitrate, and lead testing uh, for well water. So just uh, if you get those, uh, please, I encourage you to participate, but uh, it's all voluntary and it's for research purposes. Okay, so a question about that is, is that targeted and being sent to certain people or is it kind of an open call and then you'll decide based on, on who responds? So we have been doing targeted recruitment, looking at uh, well logs and trying to find properties and sending mailing and letters uh, to folks that we think have a well. Uh, and then inviting them in to look at the study materials that way. But if people are, have a well and are interested in doing this, uh, we also have direct confirmation, uh, contact information and you can find it at oregonstate.edu slash wellwater. All right. Well, everybody be looking for that. Uh, let's see, uh, how about Commissioner Addington and uh, followed by Vice Chair Barrasso? Thanks, Chair George, and I just want to thank uh, Commissioner Kyle for um, the, the swap back here on OWEB. Uh, I've actually really enjoyed uh, my brief time uh, just filling in for her, just keeping the, the chair warm for her uh, in there. Um, I've really enjoyed sort of getting to know that agency a little better and the uh, the other um, board members on, on OWEB. It's been really enjoyable. They do great work. Uh, they, uh, it, it's the fun part. It's, you know, giving money out for, for good projects. And so I will miss that, but I just really appreciate it as I settle into a new position here with, uh, a, a lot of things coming my way. So, um, thanks, uh, Commissioner Kyle for, for doing that. Um, and then I just, uh, Chair George had one other thing. I just wanted to say thank you, uh, publicly to, Leah, who um, came down to Salem and participated uh, yesterday on a panel with a couple of other agency directors for a group that I'm involved with. Um, these are those kind of things that you don't always plan out in your weekly schedule and they, they sort of come at you and, and make you have to do more work somewhere else. But she did a great job uh, representing the agency and um, I just want to acknowledge and, and say thank you to Leah for doing that. Much appreciated, I'm sure. Uh, Vice Chair. I don't know if, I, I, um, Chair George, I see Leah's hand and I don't know if that's in response to. Um... Oh, okay, yeah, sorry. But if, if no, so, I, by all means, uh, Director Felden, jump right in. No, no problem. Thank you, Chair, Vice Chair. Thanks, Commissioner Addington. Um, first of all, I just wanna say it was, it was a pleasure. It really was, and I think that, um, you know, the program that you started, I think, six years ago, maybe, Real Oregon, um, it's it's a really neat program, and the cohort yesterday of, of folks that are in there from, you know, farmers to agency folks to, you know, particular um, companies, it just was a super impressive cohort of individuals, and um, I'm just a big proponent of programs like that, that kind of help people mid-career and acknowledge the ongoing learning that, that we all need to do sometimes mid-career when you're out in the real world and not in, you know, academia anymore. So I really, um, really just appreciated the opportunity. It was great and, and want to acknowledge the time that you've put in, in developing that program and keeping it going and bringing, um, you know, speakers to the program, even now that you've handed it off. So thanks for the service that you've done there for the community. I see the nod. Thank, thank, thank you, Chair George. Um, uh, I, I think I just want to share a quick update was um, as part of my work um, over with, with the city of Portland. Uh, earlier this week, we just we did release um, as part of a, a, a sort of um, a shift in our programming within the Portland Clean Energy Fund. We did release a preliminary draft of our five-year climate investment plan, which is setting the stage for about $750 million of worth of investment over the next five years. Within the city of Portland, however, 
um, and, and some of it within the broader region. But I just wanted to name that, and, and I did already go ahead and share that with some of the um, the climate staff to give them a heads up and encourage them to to chime in and see where the overlap exists with the agency's work and, and provide comment. So just wanted to name that, um, and, and I already shared that with um, with Colin McConaughey uh, as well as Nicole Singh. Appreciate that very much. Uh, Commissioner Slusher, do you have anything for us? Hi. Um, no, I don't have any updates this month. Sorry. No, no problem at all. Uh, I don't have much myself, and but you know we did just meet pretty recently as well, and and we were pretty busy with uh, DEQ related meetings before that for sure. So. Um, I guess the only thing I was going to mention is something that uh, I've uh, shared an email with DEQ staff, but just mentioned altogether is not too long ago when we were getting uh, an update on the EV work and, and related work associated with transportation. Um, you know, there was reference made to a variety of sources uh, of, um, of revenue that may be available to communities at, to help with this transition, right? We're, we're transitioning our transportation. Uh, economy and infrastructure. And we know that that's going to take a lot of investment. We know it was going to require investment in charging stations throughout the state and things like this. And, and resources will be coming. Uh, and in the Portland area, uh, Sam's a part of, of some of, of that uh, transition to, um, to greener ways of working. But uh, way out, out here in rural Oregon, um, we're trying to do this work ourselves um, on the Grand Ronde Reservation. And I know many other communities are as well. So I just reached back out to our staff and um, wanted to just suggest that we do whatever we can to let communities, whether they're small towns or counties or, or large organizations, right, that just have large fleets or large parking lots, uh, you know, what, what are the anticipated resources that are coming um, and what kind of, what do we know about what timeframes in which they'll be available? What do we know about what resources will be available in what areas? Because I just think um, that there's a tremendous you know, number of different scale communities throughout the state who are all going to be thinking about how they need to respond and participate in this transition. And I think right now, um, you know, I have people are just Googling charging stations. And, um, and I know in a lot of cases, it's going to be, you know, um, gas companies. Certainly, we've experienced that as well, who have reached out and said, hey, why don't we, why don't we put in a charging station for you? And then, you know, we'll, be the ones to, to charge off that and make proceeds off of that. And, and that might in some cases be a good way for people to go. But I was just wondering how can DEQ, working with other partners, probably at ODOT and others, but how can we facilitate some sort of way in which uh, all the folks who are making plans for this can get the information about what's coming. And so I think, uh, again, we're gonna coordinate with staff and uh, decide what's the best way to try to share that information and get it out to folks. So appreciate the follow-up on that. Other than that, I don't think I have any updates either uh, this time. Okay, not seeing any other hands frantically waving. Oh, there we go, Commissioner Kyle. Well, actually along that same line, it's what I was thinking of when uh, the TMDL posting. So for instance, there's a ton of money right now uh, for upgrading septic tanks and things like that and trying to get that information to rural communities and also just then the homeowner that might need that uh, does require kind of a concerted outreach uh, strategy. And so thinking about that along the lines with the TMDL, recognizing that DEQ might actually not be uh, the only agency that should be involved with that. So how do you coordinate with uh, more local agencies or things that have more community trust. Um, so thinking along the lines of, you know, OSU extension agents, for instance, or Grange halls or the SIP programs that were part of uh, trying to get into uh, agricultural land, things like that, where there is so much opportunity right now. And it sort of feels like a little bit like once in a lifetime opportunity. And how do we make sure that those resources actually get where they will do the most uh, good and help to address some of the equity issues that we're hoping that these bills come through with? So I think there's a real thoughtful strategy that needs to happen um, that involves a lot more uh, participation with local agencies so that we do make sure that the 
areas that have the least amount of resources get a fair shake at all of this. Really well said, Commissioner Kyle. And if I can add to that as well, um, yeah, it, to, to, to accomplish the kind of environmental justice goals that we've been speaking at at a very high level, I think one of the things we're definitely, DEQ is gonna have to do is think about what are the, the routes, the methods, the approaches that DEQ uses to let people know when resources are available and how have we done that traditionally and how might we reach communities that we may not be reaching now or have not reached effectively in the past. Of course, uh, working on, on an Indian reservation, I think about our rural tribes. Uh, what outreach should we or could we be doing to them? Uh, and, and other communities as well, of course, and community organizations that we may not have reached out to in the past, but that, as you say, might be trusted uh, communicators, trusted sources of inform information. Uh, you know, maybe they're, they're nonprofit groups, but who have a wide outreach to a particular community that may need these services, but is, you know, never going to think to go to a DEQ website on their own. So um, all, all part of kind of thinking forward towards the goals that, that uh, DEQ has. And Director Felden, I think I saw your hand as well. Yes, thank you, Chair, and thank you, uh, Commissioner Kyle. Um, these are really good points and things that I'm thinking about a lot right now with all of the um, federal dollars coming at us, um, as you've mentioned. And um, in some cases, well, let me just first give Jennifer Weigel a heads up. I think she um, would be able and might want to speak to this a little bit. So um, Jennifer, if you're there, um, I'll give you that opportunity as well. Um, in, some of the, in some of this work, um, we are actually um, actually doing our um, funding and granting to local governments as well or other gov other governments. And so that does help when we, um, in, you know, an example with, with on-site monies um, for septic repair, a lot of times we're going through a county program and the county is the one that um, applies to us. And so then they can help get the word out more locally. But I don't want to lose the point of, of what I hear you saying in terms of, you know, a lot of these monies are intended for disadvantaged communities very specifically. And if our traditional systems of getting the word out um, to folks who are already in the know or already just hooked into our normal, you know, modes of communication, that's not going to be reaching the people that we're trying to reach. Um, so I really take that point um, to heart. And it's something that I'm thinking a lot about too, because, you know, as we've all acknowledged, the money is coming at us quickly and comes with timelines for getting it out the door quickly as well. Jennifer, is there anything you wanted to add on that? Um, thank you. Thank you, Leah and uh, Chair George, members of the commission. A few things just uh, uh, agree 100% with the problem statement as well. It is, it is super challenging. I think, you know, we, it is really, we, we know the dollars that are coming into our agency, but to keep track of all the other dollars and the other agencies and the federal direct fund, federal funding sources that are going through other agencies, I know how hard it is for us. So, you know, that's only exponential when we think about potential recipients of all of those dollars. So I think this is, it's just going to be something we're going to continue to learn and try to do better on. A few things that we are really thinking about um, one is is ensuring that we are as tight as we can be with our sister agencies, so including OWAB, Business Oregon, um, OHA, um, uh, you know, ODA, NRC, and the federal agencies, ensuring that we have, I mean, we have good relationships and we're working really hard to make those even tighter. And I think then we're also thinking about what are better ways in which we can we can build on the work and the foundation that we already have. And so Leah mentioned some of those through the on-site septic grant fundings. So working with folks like Craft3 is an organization that really specializes in some of those um, small communities that, you know, low income uh, frontline communities, working with, um, you know, Verde and other groups and bringing those into our, you know, we brought a lot of, a lot of those, those relationships and built some of those relationships through our clean water SRF rulemaking process. So we're also hoping to leverage that forward and be able to use some of that learning and relationships as we think about the programs. And then like Ryan mentioned earlier in our legislative overview, there are a few positions in our um, um, governor's recommended budget that would help us build a little more capacity to both seek money, get the money out 
coordinate funding streams of money and to be able to in, engage across the board. So, you know, I think for us, just being humble about where we are in terms of continuing to improve, but also trying to make sure that we're as tightly connected as we can with the entities that we work with in our sphere to, to try to not make it more complicated than it already is. And if anything, try to, you know, really think about how do we be strategic and get money where it's most needed as efficiently as we can. Vice Chair Bresson. Just a small quick reminder for uh, commissioners are the annual statement of economic interest filing opportunity opened up a couple of days. So take a look if you haven't, because uh, I know some of us didn't see that uh, last year or the year before. Good reminder. Thank you very much. Okay, well, uh, since we are a little bit behind schedule, I think it would be good to move forward with our public forum. Uh, so that we'd be sure to have enough time for that. Uh, and so Jennifer, I suspect that you are probably the person on deck to kind of provide our reminders about how we run our public forum time. Chair George, commissioners, this is Jennifer Flint and that is correct. I will facilitate this. At this point, we request that all people interested in commenting indicate their interest by either raising their hand through Zoom it's typically in the reactions panel. If connected through phone, please press star nine. We'll take a short pause for people to complete this action. And then I will let Chair Joe know how many people we have in the waiting room. Let's see. Chair Joyce, commissioners, this is Jennifer. We do have a few people ready to go in the waiting room and I will um, unmute them and uh, provide you with their name and um, start when you're ready. So Excellent. in the speaker's queue right now, we have Caleb Lay. And I can't see the organization, so Kayla, please um, state the organization with which you are representing. Uh, hello, thank you very much, Chair George, uh, Vice Chair Barrasso, Commissioners. Uh, my name is Caleb Lay. I'm with uh, Oregon Rural Action. Uh, we're a small nonprofit working out uh, in rural Oregon with well owners in the Lower Umatilla Basin. Uh, as I've heard. Today, you're all aware of the, the extremely high levels of nitrate those folks are dealing with and the emergency that, that we're faced with in the lower Umatilla. I uh, just wanted to take a moment to uh, congratulate Director Felden and uh, welcome her to her official role as DEQ Director. Uh, we're really looking forward to uh, her leadership and uh, all of the experience she brings to the table. Uh, we know that uh, we're really going to require her leadership as we look to resolve this crisis and. Uh, and fulfill the EQ's mission of providing that clean water to everyone. Uh, I wanted to say that um, I, want, I do have a question I'd like to ask. And so given that the DEQ is responsible for assessing the uh, voluntary approach to reducing nitrate levels in the lower Umatilla Basin every four years, and after two voluntary lower Umatilla Basin Guama action plans have failed to meet the goal of reducing nitrate to seven milligrams per liter over the span of, of 25 years now, uh, I wanted to ask what factors is DEQ going to use to make the decision to move beyond voluntary measures towards something more mandatory to protect, protect groundwater? And what more do you need to see uh, to make that decision to protect groundwater and thereby protect the health and, and the well-being of the people who live in the lower Umatilla. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. And thank you for those questions. Uh, please know that we're definitely making note of them and that we will engage with Director Felden uh, on those questions. So thank you very much. But at, at this time, we'll, we'll let the next speaker go. Thank you. We are unmuting Shannon Watson-Clark. Uh, 
Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, Chair George, Vice Chair Barrasso, members of the commission and Director Feldin. Uh, good morning. My name is Mick Shannon Walton Clark, and I'm the Senior Policy Manager at Forth. Forth is a nonprofit organization dedicated to the equitable advancement of clean transportation. For more than a decade, Forth has been building program and policy models that significantly expand equitable access to electric transportation in the U.S. and beyond. Recently, Oregon's Department of Environmental Quality has announced the suspension of Oregon's popular rebate for electric vehicles, the Oregon Clean Vehicle Rebate Program, or OCVRP, effective May 1st. This is a huge step backward for Oregon's climate change efforts and will delay the critical and equitable transition to electric vehicles in the state. Dramatically increasing the use of electric vehicles is one of the most significant steps we can take to reduce transportation emissions, improve air quality, and advance equity in transportation. The legislator recognized this and helped pass the standard rebate and the charge ahead rebate to incentivize the purchase of electric and hydrogen vehicles. This commission just recently adopted Advanced Clean Cars 2, and that was a powerful affirmation that Oregon is on a path to supporting clean transportation. Suspending the OCVRP sends the opposite message. An uncertainty around federal EV incentives compounds the issue and has created unnecessary confusion in the marketplace. Oregon is a national leader for taking decisive measures to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and being on the front line when it comes to climate policies. The OCVRP is a significant example of this leadership and is essential for all Oregonians to experience cleaner air and a more equitable future. This program has helped place Oregon, Oregon in the top five states of EV sales, but even with this critical investment, we are still behind meeting our climate goals. Fourth, would like to highlight House Bill 2613, which would appropriate $30 million to the EV rebate program, thus helping it continue into the 23-25 biennium. We formally request the EQC work with the legislator, the governor, and agency staff to secure that funding immediately to minimize the disruption to Oregon's electric car rebate. Rather than permitting this program to be a victim of its own success, Oregon must recognize the program's many successes and provide the funding that is needed to meet actual consumer demand. Oregonians are eager for a clean transportation future, but EVs cost more than their fossil power competitors and working people need help making this transition. We thank you for the opportunity to comment on this important climate and equity issue. We encourage the commission to support the DEQ with the resources needed to minimize the suspension to OCVRP and revive this essential program. Thank you. Thank you. Chair George, commissioners, this is Jennifer Flint, and at this time, we do not see any additional raised hands in the speaker queue. Okay, so um, hearing that, uh, if anybody else does want to give a public comment at this time, please do raise your hand. And since we do have a little bit of time, Yes, I think what we can do is we can go ahead and go to Leah Felden and um, maybe give her an opportunity to speak to some of the issues raised. Uh, thank you for being willing to do that, uh, Director, kind of on the spot. But these are things that I think you are very familiar with, these issues that have been raised. So we'll go ahead and give you an opportunity to kind of share some of your thoughts. Thank you, Chair George. And um, thank you to Caleb and Shannon for the thoughtful comments. Um, appreciate them both. They're both um, matters that are definitely on, on my mind a lot um, these days. Um, so speaking first to the Lower Umatilla Basin groundwater um, issues that Caleb lay raised for us, um, it, it's been many years, hasn't it? <laughs> um, I just want to acknowledge that. That's, it's a true statement. These um, you know, these conversations have been happening for many years. And um, what Caleb referred to there was the, the way that the statute is set up once the commission um, declares a groundwater management area, the statute um, requires that a local advisory committee be put into place to discuss and determine actions for how to um, mitigate and um, reverse the situation of a groundwater management area, how to lower the nitrate level in the groundwater so that um, it is at safe levels. So um, that is that is all the case. And um, as Caleb mentioned, there have been two action plans um, so far. And um, I would say it's true that we, we haven't seen um, what we need to see out of those action plans. Most recently, there is a new chair 
for um, for that committee. And there is um, there, there are several new members on that committee. Um, one thing DEQ did in the last several months was to look at the membership and um, the representation on that committee. And we found that the representation was not as uh, robust and diverse as it should be in terms of um, what kind of discussions we need to have around those action plans. DEQ, in terms of regulatory authority, we have the authority in terms of permitting for um, industrial wastewater land application in the area, which is a piece. Um, we have the authority for um, septic systems, which is a piece. We share water quality um, authority with the Department of Agriculture when it comes to CAFO permits, um, which is a piece. And then a large piece of what's going on in the area is actually unpermitted. Um, so we, you know, in, in looking at those issues, the unpermitted issues, that's something that the local advisory committee really needs to take um, needs to take a leadership role in what what are the management strategies that are going to be used for for those um, that that aren't regulated and I just want to highlight that this is a conversation that has to include the Department of Agriculture it's not um, DEQ alone in terms of the authorities with that said um, DEQ and the commission um, I think I can say have an expectation that after that many years that you know those action plans are meaningful and can actually help us make progress. So we are going to be looking at the action plans and um, progress on those and figuring out um, how we move those conversations with the new committee. So I really appreciate the, the comments there. Um, with regard to um, Shannon Walton Clark's comments on the the EV rebates, we did announce the suspension of the program um, this week. Um, certainly not something we wanted to do. It is um, a, a situation of success of the program. Uh, when the program was set up, um, it was set up to be funded by the privilege tax. That tax brings in approximately uh, 12 to $14 uh, million a year. And that allocation usually comes in the beginning of um, the calendar year, in the first couple months of the calendar year. And you know, when the program was first set up, I think we didn't know um, how much of that privilege tax was going to be used in, in EV rebates, how many people were going to be buying these um, cars. And Oregon has been a leader in, um, in the purchase of electric vehicles. So um, that's... Uh, great and it, it proved that the program was really worthwhile and um, and has done a lot of good here, uh, including the charge ahead piece that, that you mentioned, Shannon, so that um, folks of lower income can receive an even greater rebate. So um, with that success, um, the program has run out of money and um, that was contemplated even when the rules were set up. The rules were set up with um, some specific protocols for suspension. This is common in states with rebate programs like this, um, that they do have to be suspended at times. Um, we don't see this as an indefinite suspension. We will get privileged tax monies uh, early in 2024, but in terms of any sort of infusion of monies um, right now, we don't have it. And those um, you know, conversations are a bit outside of, of um, DEQ's capacity. And certainly we know that those conversations um, are being had, I think, um, amongst legislators and in a tough um, budget season with a lot of priorities out there, um, we'll have to see where that goes. But the program is gearing up to make sure that we issue as many rebates as we can with the monies that are still there. And we'll be geared up to come back online uh, next year when the um, infusion of the privilege tax comes back. So thanks for that, Leah. So I think that that's helpful to know that those funds have been used up. And certainly I know that, as you said, when the rules were contemplated, one thing DEQ certainly wanted to do was that as they approached the level of those funds being used up, you know, they wanted to let people know, right, as soon as, soon as necessary so that people didn't make a purchase anticipating a rebate that then DEQ couldn't 
make good on. So uh, it's a challenging place to be. I think we wish that were different. But as you say, it sounds like right now for the time being, um, increasing that fund to some degree, that's a decision that's going to have to be made by the legislature. And so if people are interested in that issue, it's probably good for them to know that that's where those conversations are going on. And for there to be a change in, in the amount of funding, that's where those decisions would be made. Okay, well, thank you very much though for raising these important issues. Um, I do want to give one more opportunity to just see if any of our participants uh, would like to participate in the public comment. Here, George, commissioners, this is Jennifer Flint and uh, we still do not see any additional raised hands and have not heard from anyone else wishing to provide public comment at this time. All right. Well, then with that, I think, um, Director, unless you have any other uh, comments for us, I just had a, um, one or two thoughts as we adjourn. I, I think you mentioned the, the, your excellent intention to try to get out to all of DEQ's satellite offices in your first year as director. And, and I just wanna commend you for that. Uh, we all know that uh, depending on where you live across this beautiful state, your experience of, of Oregon sometimes looks very, very different. And so I really commend you uh, making that, that effort to get out to all of those different offices, uh, talk to the people you meet out there and see how things look from where they live. Uh, of course, when you're doing that, I hope you'll take maybe the opportunity to visit with Oregon's uh, nine nations that are also spread out across this state and have a very unique experience um, in dealing with environmental issues. So I hope maybe perhaps those, in some cases, those visits could, could go together or, or could happen um, in an efficient way for you in your travels. Um, the one other thing that it occurred to me is I really appreciated your introduction this morning and your discussion of all the work that's going on. You had mentioned that um, it's the governor's expectation that there be, um, I think, a DEI plan submitted for all agencies, I think in June, I think you shared. So that is, is coming up quickly, right? You also shared that, that that's a step in a, in a larger body of work for, for the department, but undoubtedly there's, there's some number of things that need to be in that plan from the governor's perspective. Um, and, and as I look at the EQC's agenda, um, I see that what we have, our next meeting will be in May. And so I would just like to follow up um, and maybe after this meeting and see, you know, what if any opportunity there can be for the EQC maybe to review that plan or see what's in it or see, you know, how, what, what step DEQ's vision for this work is, is going to be taken in, in this first step of a plan that will be submitted to the governor's office in June. So I'd like to follow up with you about uh, those ideas and, and follow up with the, the commission, probably via email after today. Chair George, uh, commissioners, thank you. Yeah, taking those in reverse order, we're happy to share the, the DEI plan at the next um, meeting. We are working on that um, right now with the council. It's a collaborative effort. And so I want to make sure that we um, have the time um, necessary to, to work with them, get their um, review and feedback um, before we are um, submitting that. And I really want to emphasize, and we've already had this discussion um, with our council as well, that um, again, this is um, this is a DEI plan that's reflecting where we're at today and what we're doing right now. And it's going to be iterative. Um, it's going to change every single year. And as we make progress um, and uh, really just keep working on what the future is going to look like here. So, you know, I think in terms of a strategic plan, you might see something that says, here's the five-year trajectory, here's the 10-year. And I think with the DEI plan, it's different. It should be, um, it should be actually more um, flexible and nimble than that as we continue to have conversations and needs arise. Um, so that's the goal uh, with that plan. And of course, we're happy to share that with the commission. Um, and then thank you for raising uh, meeting with the the tribes as I'm out and about. I would love uh, to do that. And I'm working on some introduction letters right now um, for all uh, nine 
tribes in Oregon. Um, and um, so those are going to be going out soon and hoping to make some good um, new and refreshed contacts there. That sounds great. All right, everyone. Um, so with that, I think I will entertain a motion to adjourn. Really? You all just want to stay here. You just, you can't get enough of this stuff. So moved. Seconded. Excellent. Does anybody object to adjourning? Seeing none, we are now adjourned at 1152. Thanks everybody very much uh, for a good meeting and we will be talking to you soon. Uh, thanks everybody. Well, thanks, commissioners. Thanks.